Yeah, you better cover yourself up. <laughs> cover that ugly face up, huh? <laughs> How's it going, brother? Good, you? Good. You look like you're you're in turmoil today. Look at us both with fishing Canada shirts on today. Mine yeah. new, mine's new and improved. As you're, you, you're, you're trying to copy. Right. You're trying to give yourself a, a leg up there with a mine is up. mine is kind of used, overused, and and a lot of work being done in the shirt and it's and it's entire life. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you are fluffing me off right now. You got so much shit in your head right now. I got right now, now. I know your attitude. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, um, hello everybody. Yeah, We're here. Yeah. Almost didn't make it, but uh, here we are. Here we is. And uh, so today's show, we've we've got uh, we've got a bit of time to answer some of your questions. Apparently. Apparently, uh, we've been told that we're not being fair with the uh, with the answering of the questions, so we're not giving enough time to it. Right. So today, we're going to give you enough time. Now, Angelo, who told us that that problem? Was it, was it the audience that on the list, or was it somebody internally? Right. The first time I caught wind of it was from Sarah. She says, okay. she says they told me that they are pissed off at you because you're not answering the audience questions. So I didn't ask any more questions at that point. I said, well, if they are pissed off, then we need to fix that. So that's what we're doing. We're fixing it. So I don't know who they are. Might have been. It might be Mike. Might be Jordan. Mike. Uh, Mike. Is it you? By the way, is it they that Sarah's referring to you? Well, that would have been he. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh my god, that was good. That was well done. <laughs> if it was you, good on you, buddy. That was good. So anyway, we apologize. I apologize. Pete apologizes. For sure. For Everybody sure. who needs to apologize will apologize if we have not been uh, um, giving enough time for enough questions. Time. And you know what? That's the way this thing started too, right? We started out yeah. with uh, us uh, interacting with the audience, and yeah, sure. Uh, every show should have part of it. And, and the more guests we have, as in last week, three guests is the less that the audience can get to participate because we have three uh, us with the three guests plus the audience. So it's sort of like uh, it's a tough one. So. Today, we are going to give you your every wish and need for they, for them, for those that are pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> Whoever they are. Uh, we, will have, we will have a guest on a little bit later on, around 1 o'clock. We're going to bring on um, a gentleman that I first interviewed, uh, I think, in January or February of this year, just sort of pre-pandemic, or, or just as we were starting to to talk about the, the whole COVID-19. Um, Jim McCormick was his name, is his name uh, from Port Hope. He's with the uh, community of Port Hope. And he was on the radio program to talk to us about the fact that they had decided that they were in fact going to shut down uh, the steelhead fishing opportunities that normally uh, we've all been accustomed to for, well, ever since I was a kid. Uh, because of COVID, they were gonna shut it down and not uh, take a chance on bringing people into their community and they did and it went okay everything was was fine um, but now they're back to tell us that they're going to take the same approach uh, for the salmon run this fall so Jim will be in to talk to us about that at some point later on uh, in the program which is very uh, interesting because they because Port Hope did indeed lift the ban from the water's access, from the river's access after the May 2-4 weekend. So to let people either fish or walk the creek and watch the, walk the river, enjoy that beautiful river in Port Hope and, and, and justifiably so because now there's no crowds, no bunches of people in that. It is of concern, and I'm, I'm, I, Angie and I haven't even talked about this, but I know right now when this comes up, we'll talk about it. And you know what? There's a lot of people that hit that river again for salmon, and they get arm to arm, and they get close, and they don't uh, think be, they're not that cautious. And it's in the influx of anglers from all over the province that come here to catch a 30-pound fish. So, yeah, so yeah you know, the big difference is going to be, and we'll talk about it with Jim when he comes on. The big difference is, you know, when this was done uh, at the beginning of the year, pre pre pandemic. Um, 
you know, we didn't know what we were up against. Nobody really knew. And, and so now we've been living with it for several months and we've got a little better handle on it. Uh, and in fact, you know, we're in stage three in, in pretty much the entire province in terms of gatherings and, and whatnot. So I think, I think this one's going to be a tough one, man. But, well, he's got some interesting, uh, he's got some interesting points too, because of the, the, the amount of staff that can, that are, you know, clean up staff, for instance, along the river, just the garbage right, alone. Right. So there's concerns in that too. So we'll, we'll get into it later, but. Uh, okay. um, so first of all, are there any questions up there now, Mike, you just had one up, you flashed it and you took it away. I didn't get a chance to see it, but whatever, whatever you got, uh, put them up. That was just a lovely feel good message. I thought I would share. Oh, you, oh, you think we need a feel good, do you? Uh, it's a nice little, this is a very nice comment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Dylan says that my dad always was watching you guys when I was a kid. Uh, you guys are synonymous with definition of Canadian angling. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dylan. It yes, is, uh, it's, um, you know, one of the, one of the perks about being on television for almost 40 years is that, is that people do get to know you. <laughs> sure uh, sure but um, and we appreciate the comment. Jay Kent. Jay Plant heading to a trout lake near Al Alvin. Alvin. Is that uh, where near uh, Knowlton? 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 Um, oh, Alvin is up. By, isn't Alvin up by his French River? Yeah, Knowlton. Uh, what's what's the name of the, uh, the the little town there? Starts with an N. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 you know what I'm talking about. No, no I, I do, but I know Elba no, right off. Uh, Noelville, Noelville. Noelville, yeah, it's right off. Uh, it's on our way to Chaudier Lodge as we go right Yeah, for sure, right? yeah. Um, Hoping to uh, see at least my first muskie. Uh, any bait tips for this time of year? As a matter of fact, I just spoke with Steve Nedzwicki, the former owner of uh, uh, Chaudier on the Upper French, and he has a he has a, an island cottage or cottage island island cottage whatever still there and he uh, spent the last week there with some buddies of his they were musky fishing and um, um, he said it was pretty slow now two weeks prior he did extremely well but I think in the next week or two the temperatures seem to be I think anyways on the on the slide. And um, I think the next week or two could be really good uh, up on the French, uh, for sure. The uh, the water temperatures are now, for, in certain parts of Ontario, not even way up north, are hitting in the 60s. They have dropped from the 70s now. Last okay. weekend, it was 68 and a half. So they are touching into that area. These hot days will bring it back up a little bit, but it's the cool nights that will keep it down into that 60 range. Now, that when the water is in the mid to high 60s, that's good fishing for a lot of species. Do you re remember what the temperature was when you and I caught those two fifties on the French a couple of years ago? It was fall. No, I don't remember, Inch. Honestly, I don't remember. It was still it was cold. Still decent though. It was still uh, uh, the water temperature was still decent. I think because we were running them big bucktails. Well, I mean, you can do that any time of year, anyways. But um, God, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, no, no, I didn't. Do, I don't think I took any. I was going to say I have metadata of the. Uh, on a still image, and you know, we could find out from the the date, but it still wouldn't. I mean, you'd have to transpose that into yeah, it'd be in the sixties for sure. I, I I'm going to throw it out there. It it's available. It's on fishingcanada.com. If you go to, or even our YouTube channel, if you go to the episode where we we caught those two, I think it was two years ago, three years ago, yeah. on the French River Giant Muskie. Uh, I'll bet you the um, the hot spot on that episode has the temperature, the water temps. Cause yeah, we might, always, actually you might, you're right. It might have that. Yeah, it might so be. Everybody, uh, is willing to invest a little bit of time. Let us know. Going, going back to the question. Um, I would say since it's trout lake, since it's not a, the French river, it's not the Georgian Bay. It's not any, uh, I think you should start a little smaller than normal. If you're looking for just numbers or, or hooking into a fish, I would say like a number eight, a double number eight, or even a single number eight or even six is bucktail spinner would be a good choice because uh, you're going to get lots of followers. You're going to get some smaller fish and all that. If you want to go for a big girl, so those double 10 cowbells, I mean, you're going to, you're going to kill yourself doing it. You will get big fish on it. But, but if you're looking for, if the lake isn't known for giants or anything like that, then maybe a couple of double eights and then maybe a smaller jerk bait, like a husky, a big husky or something like that 
in, you know, a, a big one in, in the world of bass or walleye, but not big in the world of muskies and all that. So you might want to downsize even a, even a MEPS musky killer or something like that, you know, is a good spinner to, to throw to get some follows, some numbers and get an idea of what the fish are doing. A few suggestions for you. There you go. There you go. With fall fast approaching, as I mentioned before, this is from Chris. I fish from shore, but have a nice spot for walleye. My question is, would you recommend larger baits, fast or slower presentation from shore for walleye? Go ahead, Mr. Bowman. You know what? I think this this larger bait thing, everybody's saying it's getting to be fall, larger baits and bigger baits and that. Yeah, it, it, it works at times, but you don't have to do that. You know what I mean? In my opinion, you're still... You're shore fishing. You're looking for bites like there. You're not being able to go out and, and travel the whole lake trolling and hitting all the break lines and weed lines and cover as much water as possible. So you're not in the absolute best areas of the lake. Now, it may be a good area. So you want to catch fish when you're sitting there up the shore. I would recommend using normal size baits. If you're running minnows, if you're running a live bait, and I, I'd say in the fall, I would start running minnows very soon if, if you're allowed to on that lake. Then, you know, you go to a medium medium sized minnow you can, you know, we can still run a large one because big walleye or small walleye hit a big minnow like that so you can go medium to large i wouldn't go with the small stuff you say, say medium to large and then as far as if you're throwing artificials you don't have to go to the super giant minnow bait for instance like we were just talking about i would say like a number nine or eleven would be ample um yeah, five inch six inch bait like that so i don't think you have to go absolute giant i think that used to be a big what do you call it? A misnomer or whatever that word is that it used to be uh, a largemouth bass in the fall. You got to throw a giant jig and a giant pig on the back of it and all that stuff. The further the fall comes in with largemouth, you got to go smaller again. I've done really well on smaller and smaller and smaller. Right, right about now, it'd be about the biggest bait you throw. And then all of a sudden, these water temps go down. You got to start coaxing fish that are, you know, the, the slower fish into that. So um, I don't know, Angie, you got anything to add on to that? I'm with you. We, we, we've, we've always talked about throwing big baits in the fall because, quite frankly, the reason being is that the food, the forage that these fish are feeding on are bigger in the fall than they are in the spring, right? They've grown all summer. And so, right. so you know, it's the old match the hatch thing. Um, but you're right. I think the situation, the, the location, uh, the fish in particular that you're fishing for, it, 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 it's, it's hard to make a judgment call sitting, you know, on your boat or in your garage as to whether you're going to throw big, big, small baits. And however, however, now having said all that, let's, let's go back to this, the actual question. So if he is on a particular spot and he is fishing a school of walleye, a school of walleye, and this is like, I'm making this stuff up because I I don't know how to answer this correctly, but think about this. If he's sitting on a school of walleye, he's, he's on shore. The problem for us, for you and I, Pete, we're having with this question is because of the shore thing, right? You don't have the opportunity to move around searching for big fish. So you have to take what you got. But let's mm -hmm. say he's on shore and he is on a point, And let's say that, that, that for whatever reason, that point is holding fish and he can actually get to them with this, with this casting from shore. Then I would think that if there are bigger fish within that school of walleye, I would think just common sense would dictate that you stand a better chance of getting the bigger fish out of that school with a slightly bigger bait. But that, yep. I, I, I'm kind of throwing it out there. Um, he, he said here, he said, I'm tossing deep shad wraps and I'm using live leeches is what he's doing. So, ah, okay. Uh, the live leeches, you're not going to have any option in terms of size, although uh, you can't go wrong with the biggest leech in the bucket. As far as I under any yeah. condition, whether it's early, late, cold, fall, I don't care when it is. If you're using leeches, I always like to dig into the bottom of that bucket and get the biggest one that I can. Yeah. In at this time of year, I think it makes even more uh, a difference. Uh, as far as artificials go, that, that deep shad wrap is a, is a great bait. You know what I mean? I don't think you need to throw the biggest one. I think you'd very, I mean, he's probably only got one. Maybe Chris has got one or two sizes like that. that but the depth is probably more important than the, than the size of the bait. I would say there, you know, the different running bit, find that right depth and pop it past the wall. I, and he's going to eat it. So bottom line, having said all this, if I am hunting for big fish only and, and 
its quality and quantity has absolutely nothing to do with my outing. And I'm going to be moving around hunting for big fish in big fish locations. I will throw bigger baits. How's that? But in your case, I don't think that would be the smart thing to do. I think it wouldn't be prudent to throw big baits off of a point when you don't know the size of the fish that you're going to be making contact with. Hey, Chris, if, if you start fishing those walleye and the season's still open late, like let's say October, November, I would throw a big minnow then, a nice big sucker minnow, a nice four, five, or six inch sucker minnow then, because you'll even get small fish on that. But you get, I guarantee you some of the smaller fish won't eat that, and the bigger fish will. So you can keep away the smaller fish. So if that helps, once you get, you know, if you stay on a spot like that. So I hope that helps. Right? I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm more confused now than when we when we asked well, before we uh, answered that question. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, by the way, you know, having said that, in, in total contradiction to what I just said, how many of us have been out there and caught a little wee, you know, six inch bass or walleye or musky or pike on a ten inch bait? Same size or bigger bait. What yeah. the hell was he thinking? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. If that fish grows to trophy proportions, can match what he's going to eat the whole, his whole life, his or her whole life, that's going to be an eating machine. Ah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Tony wants to know, what's your favorite ice auger? Electric, propane, or gas? Those uh, those electric ones, are. I, I haven't used them yet, but I really I mean, heard great stories about them. I, have, I mean, think about that. It's just... It's perfect if you have that little wire uh, cordless uh, battery go on there. To me, that would be the ticket if I ever move to that. I mean, I've only used gas. Uh, how um, how much how much time do you get off of a battery? You know, I think they're pretty good now. From what I heard, they're powerful and they're pretty good. Yeah, so you carry a couple of batteries with you, and you can do a lot of holes. I mean, not if it's thirty six inches of ice or something like that, but in the normal, you know, a foot of ice, apparently you can get a lot of holes dug. With one battery, one charge, one battery. So, Whatever, what what's the problem with gas? Good old fashioned. Vroom, vroom, that, well, the the starting sometimes, as you know, I have a gas auger, and I'll tell you what. Sometimes you're just pissed right off because that baby is a little bit temperamental in that cold weather. Vroom, vroom, vroom. Then, of course, you turn it the wrong way one time, and then you're drilling a hole, and you come back up, and you've got exhaust, right, black exhaust. <laughs> That was brand looking. All of a sudden, you said, "Shit!" I had that thing turned the wrong way, and the exhaust just blew all over me. And then you got to get the laying it down in the sled. You got the gas; it could leak out of it, maybe not. The oil, and all. so so there is there is something to be said for you know electric. That's for sure. It's that's like a Tesla why, car. You don't put a gas in your car if you run a Tesla, right? That's why you should always bring a fishing buddy along when you go on ice fishing. <laughs> I'm with big arms. Exactly. <laughs> Somebody bigger than you, younger than you, that can do that. Uh, uh, Pete, what are your thoughts on the new Garmin Force? Mm -hmm. Well, well, D man, boy, that 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 dog sure looks like it can hunt. I'll tell you that. Sitting on oh top of and see one's bow. Oh my God, it looks uh, it looks outstanding. So we we've dropped it in the water just to test it, just power wise. Well, we haven't even calibrated it yet. So, yeah. uh, but so far, oh my God. This thing looks amazing, sounds amazing, is as strong, uh, the strength is amazing. Everything so far, the remote is amazing. Everything so far, and we haven't even touched upon it yet. There is, there is only one thing that we have found that even is remotely negative about it. Otherwise, it is 100%. Everything about it they, is well thought of. They, uh, the engineers really did their job on this one. I mean, it is, it's got everything. Even if you're thinking of something, all of a sudden you look at, oh, it has that. It's got that. It, 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 they have thought of absolutely every possible perk that you could build onto an electric motor. It has yeah, that. That's typical of, of a company like Garmin. Garmin, they don't want to go into there and say, oh, let's just put out a trolling motor. They're going to go in there and put the best trolling motor out there. And it's, it, it, you, you have to experience it. It is, it is unbelievable. I mean, you got you got three ways of running a trolling motor. You got your foot pedal, you've got a hand remote, and you get your fish finder. You can run your trolling motor off your fish finder. Like think about that kind of stuff. So it's just it's and and and, and 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 the hand control is not your typical ordinary push the button and hold. Not it. Just, yeah, you can do that if you want. 
you can actually do that if you want, but you actually turn it with the hand. Like you, you, you do stuff with with the, with the controller. Just position it, and it motor responds to it. It's oh, great! So there's a feature on it where you say, "Hey, Ange, we're gonna tie our baits up. I want to go over that. Where's my hand? That direction over there." So you hold a button down, you let, let it go on the remote. The motor automatically turns and goes that direction until you stop, and it does not stop. It's got cruise control with speed cruise control. So not only are you just running along uh, a brake line or a troll speed or, or a trolling pass or something like that. If the wind picks up, the motor gets stronger. It's like car. It's like cruise control in a car. If you're going up a hill, it gives more gas. It's incredible. The things that things are the, the electronics world is coming out with now. It's incredible. The motor is included into it. You know, the jury's still out on it because obviously it's going to take uh, thousands and thousands of man hours working it to uh, to really get all the bugs out and see if there are any bugs. But boy, I'll tell you, like I said before, so, it looks like it can hunt. I, I, I was talking to our buddy Ryan Flero uh, yesterday or this morning, whatever, about and about the force, the Garmin Force motor. And he borrowed uh, a guy's boat, a buddy of his boat uh, that has the force on it. He fished. Lake St. Francis, a full day tournament in Lake St. Francis in that current. Angelo, you know that current. It's about two uh, miles an hour, two ish mile. He says he held in that current all day long. And the battery gauge on the trolling motor, which it has now, the little power gauge on the trolling motor, which is another nice feature, was down 30% at the end of the day. He had 70% left on that thing full all day. Wow. So that's an efficient motor, too. This brushless wow. motor apparently is efficient as hell. So yeah. Else we got to look forward to, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, anyways, you can tell we're impressed. We are uh, thoroughly impressed with this motor. Thank you for asking that. Yes. Uh, Adam uh, McCormick, late in the day, uh, throw glass. Oh, he's talking about the the musky question on the French River, right? Late in the day, throw a glide or jerk baits. Towards shore near weeds or deep water for musky up near the French uh, in Nipissing. Okay. I'm assuming that's a tip. He didn't ask it as a question. So, and he's got a great point there. It's a question from earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is a great, that's a great suggestion. I mean, the glide, glide baits are so much fun. Eh? They're such mm -hmm. a, it's like a soft, it's like us using our soft jerk baits for, for uh, smallmouth or something like that, you know what I mean? These uh, flutter baits, flukes, and all that. They're just push, but you and like you and Nizwiki got onto that jerk bait thing for pipe or that. That was great. Yeah, it was great. And we we're fighting over that blurry head. Boy, that thing was on fire, right? That thing is so good. So, uh, Jerry wants to know what part of Lake Nipissing is the most productive in the fall. Wow, that's a, that's Lake gonna be a, tough that's a big body of water, man. I'll tell you. A musky? Uh, you think he's, he might even be, I hope he's talking musky. I think so. I think so. But you know, the river mouth, the river mouth of the French going into Nipissing is a can't go wrong spot in the area. There's weed beds there. There's humps there. There's lots of walleye there. There's lots of food there for musky. If you're, or there, if you're walleye fishing, there's lots of walleye there too. So the mouth of the French is a very good area of, and it's a big area of the. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the whole French River. The whole French River is 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 the Upper French, right up to the mouth is loaded with. This time of year, it's it's a gold mine. But yeah. the mouth is great. You know, you can find uh, remaining clumps of weeds and stuff out there. They like to hang out there because obviously that's where food lives, right? Uh, yeah, you can't go wrong anywhere up in that area. You can't go wrong. It is absolutely outstanding. Yeah. For sure. um, yeah. 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 By the way, before we get to uh, Dylan, um, I want to remind folks about the poll. We have a poll going on right now um, regarding uh, catch and release fishing. And uh, the question is, and it's going to be answered, I think, at 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock, yeah. We're going to tally it up. Um, but you got to check it out. If you're into catch and release, or if you're not into catch and release, it's probably even more important to, uh, to check out the poll and give us your feedback. Uh, and weigh in so that we can tabulate and see where, this, where we are. This is an interesting one, eh? Because in this modern day, you know, now we're in 2020, we've had a lot of catch and release fishing going on, but but there's still a lot of people that like to catch, keep, and eat. So it's going to be a really interesting uh, result, I think. I'm looking forward to this one. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right? Oh, God. Nothing wrong with oh, eating fish, fish, especially now. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dylan Jay, how much attention do you guys pay to the moon phase? Yes, when musky fishing. 
Um, I use them a lot to justify why I didn't catch anything. <laughs> Very <laughs> well. What's true? So I say this all the time when people ask about that. Um, we've done programs on this. If you are if you are in a position where you can actually schedule your fishing time during the peak moon phase periods versus the low moon phase periods, if you could schedule during those times as opposed to the non-moon phase times, once again, if you could limit yourself to fishing only during the peak moon phase period, you'd be an idiot not to. That's the only way I can describe it. Having said all of that, ask me, for example, how many times during the course of a year do I put myself in the optimal position to catch trophy fish during the perfect moon phase? Once? Twice a year? Maybe? Maybe? <laughs> yeah. Why? Because I don't have the luxury of only going out during those periods. I go out to fish. I don't care what the moon says because I'm out there fishing. So think about what I just said. Yes, 100%. We are convinced without a shadow of a doubt that you are more apt to make contact with superior uh, members of whatever species you're going after, bigger fish, stronger fish, during the peak moon phase period than you are at the low end, without question. It's going to stop you from going fishing? No. So there's the answer. So I'll tell you what I've seen, what I've noticed with the really good musky anglers. Now, musky anglers are the epitome of moon phase, of all the all, all that table type of fishing. And they're very smart at what they do. They're very good at what they do, okay, musky experts. And they will oftentimes, they'll if they're going up for a trip, let's say Lac Sewell or, or somewhere way up north in some big musky water, um, Eagle Lake. It's a perfect example. They got a week long trip at a lodge up in Eagle Lake. They will, they got to fish for five days in a row. These guys like to cast. Okay. They really like to throw the baits via casting. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work when they, uh, they like to throw number double number tens like we were talking about earlier. That's a chore bringing that bait in and out all day long. These guys are the best in the world at it. So this is the kind of muscle memory and they're good at, but however, that said, they don't want to burn themselves out. So they pick these certain times of the day to go out. So they're at the lodge. They get up at four in the morning. They're on the water at six to eight o'clock in the morning. They might fish another hour of after that little peak period. They go back to the lodge. They have their lunch. They don't worry about fishing the whole day. They're not going to go. I'm not going to fish for from daylight to nighttime. They go back. They have a nice rest. They have a beer. They have a lunch, whatever they do. And then they go back out for the next peak in the evening. And that's the way they, they space up. And, and, and believe it or not, they produce results because of that. These we Angela and I have learned from guys like this. We'll go to these lodges and say, "Wow, why aren't they out there all the time?" Because they don't want to waste their whole power, their whole energy, their whole day, burn themselves out on the, the lower times that have been proven in their minds uh, to be lesser of a fishing time, a good time to catch fish. So you got to think about that. The musky guys are, are great, at it. and I'm sure it trickles down in other species. And I'm I'm. A nutcase in that one. If I'm going bass fishing for the day, I'm going for the day. I'm going to throw all day long. I don't care. Like Dan said, the peak period, it can be peak at six o'clock or four. I don't give a shit. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to cast 150,000 times and I'm going to try and catch a fish. So I mean, it's, it's a different game. It's maybe not as exerting and you're, you're only there for a day. But you think about the way the musky guys have done it and they're the best at it and they use it probably to the utmost capabilities of those tables. So it's it's proven for sure. I'd be very interested to see the stats of, um, you know, when, when m and does the uh, uh, Creel census yep. you know, to see what people caught and approximately what time did you catch the fish and what yeah, day. Yeah. I'd love to take that and put a moon phase uh, calendar template over top of that, that Creel census and just see how yeah. many times you know, the stars are aligned and, 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 and those lines cross themselves, you know, giant fish, perfect moon face. Cause I think it would happen more often than we think. Probably, yeah. 
You want to check that? Do you think we could get that info? Is there? Is there to be a way of getting that info? I have that info. But, you like it? <laughs> yeah. You like it? And can you get me all the moon phase info, and then I could just have to wait something? Why don't I just get the results for you? Why don't I just do it? In other words, hurry up! What are you waiting for? Oh God! I, you know, I, I just wonder. You know, when when you hear stories about that guy's been fishing all day, and all of a sudden he he catches the you know biggest bass or muskie or walleye or trout or salmon of his life. I just wonder how many times, if we look at that, how many times out of ten, how many times. Is that going to coincide with a perfect yeah. moon phase? Probably yeah. more than we think, right? Interesting. Calvin, oh Calvin, how you doing, buddy? Calvin's um, here. Wow, we haven't heard from Calvin in a while. Hey, buddy. <laughs> uh, how often do either of you consult a color depth chart when fishing on deeper lakes? Uh, not near often enough, Calvin. Not near often enough, and so. We were around for that whole. Uh, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> well, you know, we might no, as well. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. We both spent money on it. So we were around for that original um, color phase that happened in the mid 80s, I believe it was, Pete. Am I right? Yep. Mid to late 80s. The Color Selector yep. by Dr. Hill. Dr. Lauren Hill, I think it was, right? Lauren Hill. And for a short period of time, maybe two years, it completely revolutionized and completely changed the way we all fished, uh, you know, hardcore anglers fish. Because, because everything we did, we sampled with the color selector. So the color selector was this big, gaudy, round uh piece of equipment with a face on it that had colors and needles and then it had a gauge that you drop down and and it would basically tell you what 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 is the perfect color now based on dr hill's uh experiments uh what is the perfect color for walleye at 18 feet right now under these light conditions in this water this very moment and it would say, you know, something like brown. And you look at it and say, brown? Who the hell throws brown? I'm not throwing brown here. It's probably, well, I'll test it later on. And so you put your, your, your white, your black, your blue, your green, whatever it is you normally use, and, you know, have results or didn't have results. And then you'd move to another spot. Oh, got to put the color selector down, put her down. Purple? Who the hell would throw purple in here? <laughs> Do you remember that? I mean, it was insane. It was insane. Oh, God, yeah. It was, a, it was up red for me almost every time I dropped it. It was, it was like red, red, red. I got nothing red in my box. What are you doing? <laughs> um, so we're laughing at it, but it was a great instrument, and it it definitely changed uh, the way we we looked at colors because we learned, if nothing else, we learned that that red or green or blue or yellow or whatever color it is as you see it right now in your hand on the boat is not what the fish sees 20 feet down that's what we learned uh that colors obviously transform uh at different depths uh and and not just you know sunlight affected it not not sunlight or lack thereof but the density in the water the 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 uh, microorganisms in the water change the color down below too because more density of of uh, of, of uh, animals in the water and i'm talking microscopic zooplankton uh, the less sunlight penetration down deep and that affects the color of of the uh of the lures right. so there's so much to to that whole color thing so let me ask a question now to you um, to Calvin? How important, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Bowman, how important is color? And in terms of size, shape, or color, which one is the most important in your world? Uh, those three, size, shape, or color. Wow. Uh, 
I, I don't even know if I can answer that question because shape is very high in my world. The, the shape of a bait, I think, is very high. I mean, but that shape has got to still stay in my color range, right? So I wouldn't fish with anything that I didn't like. So of either of those, um, I can't. I can't give you a, a, a one versus the other because yeah, all three of them are very prominent but, factors in my bait choice choices. According to the doc, Gord Pizer. Mm -hmm. Um, profile, yeah, shape far, far more important than size or color. Mm -hmm. Apparently, well, you know, I, I have to agree with that because if you're if you're smallmouth fishing and they're on crawfish, that that crayfish imitation of some type, from a tube jig to you know to a little mini craw or a punch bait or a, a beaver bait, is very important versus a, a, a soft stick bait like a sanko. You know, long skinny if they're on a kind of a worm bite. So there's there's quite a bit of difference. Now, that said, if they're eating crayfish and you drop a Senko down, I bet you can still catch them off Senko. You know what I mean? There's quite a bit of difference in size. And shape How, about, there How about a shad-shaped worm? A shad-shaped worm versus a friggin' big fat craw. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah it's, 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 you know, fun, you know? We, 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 we've talked about this. We, we whipped this horse to death. Okay. It, it, I, I really think an angler's confidence dictates what, which one of those three is the most important. And, and I mean that because if, if you have confidence in a profile, if in a, in a size, in a color, you're going to use it. You're going to use it more. You're going to use it more effective. You're going to fish it properly. You're going to put your heart and soul into it. And chances are you're going to catch fish. Yeah. So that, Comes your your go to and your favorite. Yeah, Pete could be standing right next to me with his favorite that he has confidence in, and it works. So you know you can we can really put way too much emphasis on any one of those three: size, shape, and color. At the end of the day, you have to believe. You know, we mentioned Dr. Lauren Hill's uh, color selector. One of the problems. One of the problems back then was confidence. We had lack of confidence in the colors that Dr. Hill was saying we needed to be using at 25 feet in that yeah. particular instance. Yeah. I didn't have confidence in purple or Pete yeah. just mentioned red, but those were the colors that, that this mechanical, uh, this, this piece of equipment, which has no bias at all, it's not capable of you know having confidence or lack thereof or opinionating, it said that right now the color red is the most defined color at 25 feet in that particular body of water. But we didn't have confidence in throwing it. So you never did. <laughs> so so I, true. It, it's important. So true. You know. Um, Stephen heading up to uh, Bisco Bisco. Bisco, the old Bisco in two weeks. I love watching you guys at Richie's. Holy mackerel. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Wow. Any tips you could share for this trip? Uh, well, I'll give you one tip. And I don't know whether it's still there or not. But if it's still available, take a, uh, a, a boat ride down to the south end of the lake, that body of water, and go over that rail system that was put in to, uh, to connect into the next lake. Do you remember the names at all, Pete? No, I don't. Honestly, I can't remember. But, but they'll know it for sure. The guys at Richie's will be able to tell you. It's a great piece of history. Apparently, the royal family or a member of the royal family back in the late 1800s um, used that area or that lake uh, as a retreat. And uh, they wanted to go into the next lake. And it was a portage. And, of course, they didn't want to make the portage. So they had an actual set of rails put in uh, one way yeah. the other that you drive your boat onto and then you get out and you pull your boat on this little like a train bed like a, a, system. Yeah. a system and you pull your boat over the, the hill over the knoll and down to the other side you get in before it starts going down and you let her go and you slide into the lake it's very cool Cool. It's so cool. And and the fishing is better in that lake because it's less pressured than Bisco. Bisco, you can drive to that lake, right? So or the, one, the one thing I'm gonna tell you though, Pete, you know, we, we didn't do well. We didn't do well in the main lake. That's why yeah. we 
got the hell out of there. And, and small and, walleye. We got tons of small. However, walleye. do you remember the hatch that we hit? The Mayfly Mayfly. hatch. It's oh Mayfly. my God! It was the worst hatch I have ever been exposed to. I yeah. mean, you literally get out of your boat and you could walk across the lake. Yeah. Circuses of mayflies that were on yeah. when we were there. You know, timing is everything. And I don't care what body of water you, you're on. If you hit it right at the peak of that mayfly hatch, you're done, man. You're done. You yeah. are toast. And there's no way of predicting it, right? It's not like you can go to the calendar and say, oh, 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 oh wait a minute. That's mayfly hatch week. No. Well, it's not going to happen in two weeks when he's going. Okay, that's, that's the good thing about that one. He's not going to hit the mayfly hatch, so you might get better fishing. You know what I mean for bigger fish. Bisco's got a ton of walleye in it. It's getting yeah. the little guys to get to the bigger ones. That's the that's going to be your key, and uh, and that's through just tri trial and error. Don't go to just the spots the lodge or whoever recommends because those right. spots are number spots and everybody hits them. Go to somewhere nearby, You know, run your fish finder, find a little hump, find a little something different, and then start working from there. Look for fish on your screens and look, and, and then go from there. That's the way you catch bigger fish, just staying away from, a little bit away from the, the popular spots, let's call it. And, and another must-do is at least a couple of hours during your stay, back to the train station and just hang out for a couple of hours. That's cool, too. My God, the people that you're going to, the characters that you're going to meet there and talk to there. Yeah. Uh, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll stay with you. <laughs> what, was that guy's, what was that old guy's name that we met there? Oh, oh my God. God. He was a character. Right? We got a picture of him, I think. We got a great picture. Of the, oh, the uh, whatever his name was. He had story upon story, but it's as typical as like Petticoat Junction. It's like one of those old TV shows where you just see these old guys sitting out there and having their coffee, maybe having a smoke out in the deck or out on the on the bench talking away, looking at you like you're an alien coming in from somewhere else. You know, hey, what are you doing here? So it was, it's great. I hope you didn't come up and catch any fish. <laughs> we caught them all years ago. <laughs> but, anyway, uh, have a great time. Great trip. Uh, Kevin uh, wants to know what type of rod to buy for carp that won't break the bank. <laughs> what kind of rod do you buy that won't break the bank for any species now? Yeah, yeah, true enough. You know what? There, there's uh, well, if you go to if, if you're looking for a great selection of carp gear, go to Carp Kit Carp Kit Canada. Simon mm -hmm. runs that, and uh, and he has got an array. He has got so much carp gear, and and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of or you can get a decent rod for a decent price. So you should you yeah. should try if you're going to go carp fishing, you should try and consider a carp rod. I mean, if you don't, then you're you're pushing the boundaries. Like a seven foot medium action spinning rod will work, but it's not a good carp rod, right? So they uh, go in eight. There's a lot of eight foot spinning rods. Angie and I, we got we've got a couple in the back, eight nine foot uh, two piece spinning rods. Those old carrot sticks, and we've used those for carp. So once they get a little bit longer and a little beefier in that butt section, they're they're not bad for it. You know what I mean? So uh, the unfortunate part is that, you know, mainstream retailers uh, have not embraced carp equipment yet. Right. Some of them, you know, have dabbled with it. So it's hard to go someplace and, and get a, a nice array of selection that you can actually look at, you know, price points and quality. So, you know, this is one case where, where I highly recommend going online and, uh, and checking out your, your selections there and, and uh, carp kit. Canada's by far, I think, anyways, in terms of selection. Yeah. Uh, with not, one of the best. Uh, and they get great delivery. The whole experience is fantastic. So, Stephen Smith, uh, hey, thanks for all of your great fishing info. I was wondering if there is any fish species in Canada that you haven't fished for. Whoa. I got one that I have not, and Angelo has, and it's called the In Canoe. I have not fished okay. those. You've got you that were, one. You weren't with us on that? Nope. nope, not on that trip. Wow. Okay. Um, I've ne I've never fished for burbot, like typically, or like specifically fished for burbot. I've never done that either. Um, I don't know what else. Oh, did you say Canada? Yeah, he said Canada. I have not fished for, and I want to catch a tiger trout out in Alberta. That would be a lovely species to catch. That's it's a, a, a roar, a roar trout, right? 
So no, it's different. Tiger, a tiger is a mix of a, uh, a brown and a brookie. Okay. And, uh, it's like a splake idea. You know what I mean? Like that. So I've not fished for a tiger and I've never caught, never really even fished for a tiger muskie. I'd love to catch one of those as well. So those are that, a few. That might be difficult, you know, to target. It's not like there's tiger muskie only in a, in a lake, right? Exactly. Uh, You'll be going for a muskie and then trying to get that one. I yeah, it would be one uh, for me too. Um, uh, we've done Dolly Varden, we've done Bold, we've done, yeah, we've done, huh, done Burbot, we've done Dogfish. Um, wow. Good one. I can't think of I can't You've never think. Of all, haven't you, kid? <laughs> uh even in 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 both our coasts um certainly the the more common species of saltwater fish we've we have fished for mm -hmm. there are there are some of them i mean there's stuff down there i fit with the wild how about how about this one what's the craziest wildest looking fish you've ever caught in canada maybe a, a ling cod they're pretty crazy though those ones out in the west coast they're a pretty nasty looking fish you know what i mean not bad, not uh, bad. Especially when they open their yapper and, and show those teeth. That's like if people think muskies are a predator, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing to using a lingcod. <laughs> For me, I mean, lingcod, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, they've got a fish out, out in the West Coast called the wolf fish, which is pretty bizarre. But and it's 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 like the lingcod, but but the head it's almost white, and the head has got almost like a wolf mane kind of. Oh wow! Our fish, but the one that's the most bizarre that I've caught out west is a ratfish and i caught it off of the uh, dock at north pacific springs which was a floating um one of the original floating lodges in bc and it was in um, um king's inlet yeah and, uh, waiting for breakfast one morning just sort of jigging off the, the 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 floating lodge which is sitting in like 200 feet of water and uh Catching rock, uh, rockfish or rock cod, or, yeah, like rockfish. Yeah. And all of a sudden, <laughs> caught this thing. It, it was the most bizarre looking fish I've ever seen in my life. And, and of course, we're screaming and yelling, and, and we're shooting. You know, the cameraman's all excited, and somebody comes in from lunch. Says, whoa, 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 I haven't seen one of those in a couple of years. And it was a ratfish. Wow. And it looks like it's the weirdest thing. It looks like a, a mechanical fish. It looks like it's all metal plating right down to the rivets. It's <laughs> it's hard. I'm serious. It almost looks like it's got little rivets holding all these metal plates on it. But but the 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 thing the reason they call it redfish got a, a snout. Looks like it's got a little nose on it with these buck teeth and sharp little buck oh my teeth. It, and beady little eyes, just like a rat. Oh cool. my god. That look does not look sound up, bizarre yeah so oh my god i saw another yeah. one there um bluefish off yarmouth i've never got a bluefish either i'd like to catch a, a bluefish that'd be one on the list too they're a strong yeah. in the salt yeah. water mm -hmm. yeah. uh bob mccray uh looking to troll uh for trout in bc properly i don't have a downrigger i put weight on the line i got it down there but couldn't see if I had a fish on. I trolled with a fish on for a while. <laughs> Any advice? <laughs> 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 heavy duty stuff to not feel that fish for sure, right? Um, don't have a downrigger. Well, you know, downrigging, controlled depth fishing on the West Coast over the last 20 years has become a staple. Um, you know, gone are the days of of uh, flat lining or, or weighting uh, your line. Controlled depth fishing with downrigger is just ideal. However, having said that, uh, Dipsy divers work really well. Uh, in fact, they've got two or three different locally manufactured versions of the Dipsy diver that work extremely well um, as well. But you know, you can't beat putting some 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 weight or lead core. Uh, lead core line. You will know you have a fish on if you have lead core line. That's for sure. The difference is you what the the sensitivity of your rod 
uh, real and line combo goes hugely up when you have lead core on because now there's no given that zero stretch in lead core you think if you think brain has got no stretch your lead core is even stretch less stretchy so that your rod tip will be bouncing i'm not sure if the problem was not i was feeling the fish or getting down i can't remember. i didn't really read the question or i couldn't understand the question fully. he didn't have a downrigger so his problem yeah. was so yeah. the lead core is a great, and they answered the lead core that, and there's a three-way swivel rig. So if you put a three-way swivel on, tie a nice big heavy weight under on the bottom of the swivel, tie your line to the top, and then the back when you uh, you tie your another piece of line onto your bait, and that works pretty good too. But it's it's heavy. You feel it; it's pretty heavy when you go down. But that's your suggestion. That's why down rigging is so important. Even a manual, a little manual down rigger. They don't have to be those great big huge electronic digital and this and digital. The little the manual. Plant -out -out yeah, they do. They yeah. do as good a job as any getting you down because the key is to be able to get your bait down to where the fish are, right? But when you get a fish on, you you, you want to disconnect from all that weight. You want to you, you don't want to fight the fish with the weight that, that's on the line, and that's why down rigging is so so. First of all, you can control the depths. You know exactly. You know, fifty feet is fifty feet. Thirty, hundred, it's precise. But more importantly, when you get that fish on, you detach yourself from all that weight and uh, and fight the fish free. And that's that's the excitement. That's the joy. That's the thrill. So I'm looking at our list here just to, to interrupt. I want to make sure our, our viewers participate in the poll, which will be revealed right. in, uh, in about 10 minutes-ish. Um, we'd love to see you guys and girls sign up, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. The boys are always pounding us to ask you guys for that, and that would really help us a lot, too. It keeps everything going. Go ahead. Is, that, is that a big deal for people? It's not a big deal, no. You just subscribe. You just hit subscribe. You know what I mean? And then, then, then you get yeah. notifications if something cool comes up. The good thing about it is if you don't want to watch, you don't watch it, but at least you get a notification that, hey, Angie's doing a great piece on top water pop art. Uh, you want to see that? Then check out this video. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, I do it. I got I got a subscription list on my side of my stuff. There's all kinds of stuff there. You know? Sometimes I feel like you know, we're asking a little too much to have them subscribe to something. Apparently, <laughs> Well, I, and, and and for me, it's it sounds like a no brainer, right? Well, why wouldn't you? It's going to be information and and entertainment that that you need and want and enjoy. Why not do it? But then I talk to our staff around here, and oh my god, like 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 asking people to subscribe and connect there is is like a major ordeal. Like oh no no no, they don't want to do that. You know, well, what the hell's the purpose of this whole internet thing, anyways? You know, if you can't. Wrong. If you can't be a part of something, then what is like? I don't get it. You just want to drift it out. Pretty easy to do, folks. Please subscribe. How's that? Thank you. Subscribe to uh, Fishing Canada YouTube channel. Subscribe to fishingcanada.com. Become a member of fishingcanada.com. Um, uh, subscribe to everything we do. Good God, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you. We're going to hurt you already. We've been here 40 years. <laughs> oh. Um, last week's interview with, uh, <laughs> with David oh, Buck, God, I love it. And, uh, Buck Martinez. Now, there was a bit of a screw up last week uh, because those two names didn't show up on our on our guest list till I think the morning of, so they weren't put on the big list that goes out as to who the guests were last week. So the YouTube presentation that 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 was put on our channel only had not that there's anything wrong with chonger but only had had david chong as the host or the guest when in fact we had dave mclaughlin and buck martinez of of the uh the blue jay uh, blue jay fame on there as well so now what what they've done our guys have done they've divvied those up so if you go to the youtube channel you'll actually see three i believe anyways three yeah. separate yeah. Uh, youtube shows uh, that'll have one as Buck Martinez, one as Dave McLaughlin, and one as uh, David Chong. I'm supposed to tell you that. There you go. Yeah, see, right there. Let's Just the interrupt there. What else? Dude, what look else? at you. Look at you, Jimmy. Well, I think that's a good little interruption there. We can go back to a question if Mikey wants to throw up a question for us. But I just wanted to make sure everybody does that. Okay, look at that. Was he ever quick? Mike is quick, I have to say, eh? He just think he's waiting there to push that button. Bowman, I'm going to be ahead. Next time, I'm going to be ahead of you. Next time, you're going to be so slow. I shore fish and want to be able to cast farther. What will help me cast better? Rod length, type, 
real, etc. You missed one thing, line. Okay, line is huge too. So the longer the rod, oh, go ahead. That's a great question, you know, it is because it's as much to us, it seems simple, but that's a great question. What's more important for casting efficiency, which is length? He wants just distance there. Yeah. Is it rod or is it real? And you said, is it line? Right. Wow. Line, line is very important in the sense of, first off, in a cast and long cast competition, you will never see a short rod. These guys use the longest rods uh, available and they look it up online somewhere. Distance casting. You will see what they do. They have gloves on because the line can rip on their hands. They get back, they wind up. <laughs> it's unbelievable how far they can cast. They all use really long rods. We went with Jerry that time, Jerry Bridger. Uh, he, he was showing us how to cast 150 yards like nothing. Um, so they use the long rods. They load it up properly. They have a, a, a high capacity reel. Usually those reels, there's another thing on fishingcanada.com where uh, Will Machette put out a, um, the bait runner versus a long spool reel. It's all about casting too. So they use these long spool reels and they're filled to the max. These reels are filled up to the max. They like just, 16th of an inch, probably more than recommended. Normally you say eighth of an inch on a spinning reel, by the way. Um, uh, so that you fill it up so that that line falls off really quickly. You know what I mean? So there's, there's a combination of all three things. So you bring it down to, in terms of a shore fisherman in, in Canada, let's say, then you might, you know, a seven to seven and a half foot rod with a, a, a nice backbone in the section towards the reel with a nice lighter tip. And it's all, and, and a, Good sized reel filled to the brim, and you will get better at casting distance. That's all. This is the layman's term of it. So I'd like to throw one more into the equation. So, so, and I'll do it in the form of a question to you, Mr. Bowman. So, if you could only pick one of these, if you could only pick one, the perfect, yeah. and I'm talking for distance casting. Okay. The perfect rod. The perfect reel. The perfect line or the perfect technique, which would it be? Rod. See, I'd go technique. I think a guy like Jerry that we had here from England a few years ago, I think if you put a poor rod with a improper reel and bad line, he could still cast that better than you and I could. That's my opinion. You give Jerry a crappy rod, reel, and line, and give me a long rod with the general uh, reel. I'll uh, do it. No, no. Give, give you the same crappy rod, reel. No, 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 no. That's, see, that, that's not what this guy's asking like that. He, wanted, he wants to have the equipment. He's not a perfect caster. This guy is not a perfect caster that asks us this question. He is an average angler. This is like the, what people were talking right. about. There. Right. right. So, so how do you take average equipment and make it efficient? with casting technique well okay. right that's, that's, that's what the, i'm saying so you go out and you gain an extra five yards on a technique right with his, with, his new, with his new technique the re five yards the reason i'm saying all of this is that you can have all the money in the world that will buy you all the best product in the world if you don't know how to use it it's still not going to work whereas if you learn Richard, you learn to use it. What? Richard, Richard Corkum says, wow, 150 yards. How much powder do you have to use? <laughs> this is gunpowder. <laughs> right. Shotguns don't even go with that. They're not even effective near that. <laughs> this guy, I'm not kidding you, Richard. Uh, this guy could cast. Uh, he could, it was incredible. He just get at me. You gotta please look it up online, people. Just to, just to look up uh, distance casters and see what they do, the technique they use, and the power they put into a cast. It's ridiculous, and how far they go. Am I right in saying he could cast three hundred feet? Oh, I, oh yeah, oh for sure. Without even thinking about it's it, he goes three hundred feet easily. Oh so, yeah, oh, these guys, these guys take casting to a whole different level, but. In watching them, you realize that it's a technique. They've they've got this incredible way of using up all of the energy that that you can in your body and in the equipment, combining it to get distance. Yeah. So that's why I was I was kind of answering that as being technique is the main thing. 
because yeah. oh, the guy, whoever asked that question, what was uh, the guy's name? Whoever the guy's name was asking that question, if you excuse me for not remembering, but you can get more distance out of what you own right now with proper technique. Exactly. However, if you can even get more distance, if you lengthen the rod, fill your reel spool up first, use it, make sure it's a spinning reel, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, maybe a combination of everything, to, but yeah, of course, technique is, 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 Paramount in everything you do in fishing, right? Results from this week's bowl are in. All right, this is interesting. Hang on, hang on. What? 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 I have to take a guess at this. We have to see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the three? Can Mikey? Can you put up just the three items? There was catch and release, one hundred percent. Can we put it up without the percent or not at all? I believe we're was kind of. In between, yeah. it was, here we go. Sorry, I don't have a graphic that doesn't reveal the answer. Okay. okay, so you tell us. But but the answers were either yes, I practice catch and release most of the time, around 75% or so. Yep. Yes, all of the time. 100%. Okay. Uh, yes, but less than half the time. Okay. Or never I eat whatever I catch. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. That's good. All right. Good. So. Take a I'm, guess, Angelo. I'm going to First say. Off, which are you? Which are you in that group? A hundred percent. You are not. You've never killed a fish for a shore lunch. Uh, yeah, of course I have. Then you're not a hundred percent. And you will continue to kill a fish on a shore lunch in the next trip. In the I don't even think it'll be a percentage point. Think about it. Over the course of a year, one hundred percent means you throw every fish back alive. All right, so 99.999% of the time. There you go. Okay. okay. However, I think, but that's not realistic. And, and it's not something that we can expect people to do. Right. Because I'll tell you why. Because we're blessed with the opportunity to go fishing more than, you know, uh, two or three times a year. And so, so we've adopted a totally different philosophy. On, on catch and release fishing. We, we've taken it to another level. Most people don't have that. And, and therefore it would be totally unrealistic for us to think that most people practice 100% or 99.9% .9 catch and release. So I'm gonna rule that one out. In fact, I'm gonna say that that one is going to be, of the four choices, I'm gonna say 100% is going to be at the very bottom percentage wise. I'm gonna say immediately above that is going to be never. So I, right? Number one is going to be 75% um, of the time. Number two is going to be half the time. Number three is going to be never. And number four is going to be 100%. I'll, I'll agree with that. Right? I'll agree with that. I am, a, I am that guy that I am the guy that is 75% uh, go back, but I love keeping and eating fish at certain times. And I'm not going to be the guy that denies it for sure. I mean, I, I've helped catch and release for sure in these past many, many years of my fishing life. If you're going to eat them, you're not going to waste them, and you like fish to eat, keep it and go for it. Absolutely. So, but I, I, agree, I agree with you. I think that's the way it's going to go. So, do, shall we reveal? Yeah. So most of the time is 55. Oh. So that's correct. That's correct, wasn't it? And that's what I said. It's a 75. All the time is, is higher than, all the time is ha better, higher than yes, but less than half of the time. But not by much. That's yeah. So, so, so the only way, the only one we screwed, I screwed up on was the uh, yes all the time and never, never, uh, I eat everything. We have to invert them, right? I thought it was the two middle ones we had to invert, but. So number one is 75% of the time. That's, yep. That's 75%, yeah. Oh, oh, number two, you're right. Yes, all of the time is number two. I'm sorry. And number three is yes, but less than half. But they're real close, right? Those are yeah. really, really close. So, wow. Interesting. Interesting. I love these polls that the Fish in Canada guys are doing. Don't you, Ange? Aren't they an interesting little fun little thing? Well, and it's interesting to see that that big, that big a chunk is saying, yeah, about 75%, which means they're eating fish, at least, you know, on, on one day of their outing, they're, they're consuming fish, which is fantastic. Yeah. 
So. That's great. Well, thank you everybody for participating in that. And, and we have an, another one going up next week. We're going to have them going up every week. And do we know, do we know what next week is? Sorry? Do we know what next week is? I don't know yet, but I know they, uh, uh, we, we gave them about uh, a dozen more questions yesterday or 15 more questions yesterday. So we got 15 weeks worth of questions that we can uh, anticipate. And they're all, you know, they're coming from Angie and I. We're, we, we're uh, thinking about this stuff and just you know, popping out these questions if the guys like them when we, uh, we throw them up. So, um, Interesting yeah. story out of the East Coast uh, 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 recently about largemouth bass showing up. Uh, yes. The uh, Jeff Wilson from uh, e the East Coast gave us a, a great blog that's up on. Um, on Jeff was on here earlier. He's he might be still watching. He was on here. Yeah. Earlier. His name, yeah. Uh, well, largemouth bass in Eastern Canada, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. Really, very, very, very. And I don't think they just showed up today or last week. I don't think well, they they've got they've got five pounders out there now. You know how old those things are. They don't yeah. show up last week to be five pounds. That's you know what I mean. There's some if, if a fish in that environment is five pounds, these are fifteen year old fish probably. <laughs> you know what I mean. So they've been around for a while. Yeah, it's just that nobody's fished them, and and you know um, there there have been few enough incidental catches that the reports haven't really surfaced, and now all of a sudden there they are. I remember the same thing happened in northern Ontario. I remember having discussions with Gord Pizer, oh, 20 years ago, and uh, talking about largemouth and him. And at that time, he was just freshly, he was either still with m &R or had just retired from the m &R. He was, uh, um, I think he was a, a, a lead manager with that group in North Northwest. Right. Anyways, I remember talking to him about, about largemouth in Northern Ontario. He said, no, no, we have nothing like that up here. They pretty much, you know, peter off. They don't get, they don't come up north of Sudbury and, right. you know, that. And, right. and, uh, and of course, I asked him why and what was his opinion and all that stuff. And, you know, of course, there, it's too far north and temperature, climate. There's all a million different things, you know. But the truth of the matter is that nobody was wishing for them. Exactly. Nobody exactly. Nobody was hunting them down. And same as West Coast in Canada. I remember in 1980, going to Western Canada, BC, in fact, Vancouver Island, and hearing stories, but very, like they were almost like uh, mythical stories. Right? <laughs> about, yeah, it was almost like Bigfoot. Yeah. About the green little fish that lived out there that nobody ever saw, but they heard about. And, That's and, awesome. You know, it was called a bass. A what? What? <laughs> 1980 yeah. in BC, there were rumors of bass. Yeah. And of course, we know today that those weren't rumors. Uh, they were incidental catches. Since those early days, people have been targeting bass out in the West Coast, and, and, and there's a ton of bass out there. All of a sudden, we find out there's a ton of bass out there. Yeah. And I think... I think we can apply that that same logic now to Eastern Canada, uh, and that is that that bass have been there for a while. We just sure. do right now that all these bass heads are down there fishing them. Yep. Okay, they're finding them. So that's, that's cool. why they've got a nice little uh, secret fishery to themselves. So definitely check out uh, Jeff's blog. It's very interesting, um, and hopefully, hopefully one day we can get out and shoot a show out there on largemouth. That would be kind of fun to you know be able to do that. Uh, are, are they still completely closed off to any any invasion of us Easterners or Westerners into the East? Uh, right now, I believe they are. I'm, nope. I'm pretty sure they still are. So it won't, it won't be happening this year. But uh, now, apparently, our, our guest is in the wings, my, uh, Angelo, and he's, he's waiting. So we could probably, uh, I don't know if we want to introduce him again or how we want to do this. But. Speaking of being closed off, uh, due yeah. to <laughs> COVID viruses and all that, as they are in the East Coast, um, early this year, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, having this gentleman on as a guest on Outdoor Journal Radio. And the reason we brought him on, because uh, they had announced that they were going to take it upon themselves to close the fishing uh, access to the fish on the Ganaraska River uh, out of the community of Port Hope, the town of Port Hope. 
And uh, so we had him on to talk to us about it. And, and it raised quite a big kerfuffle, as we all know. But they did it. And it worked. And now um, it worked so well that they would like to use that same uh, philosophy of, of closing access to those fish during peak periods so that they don't get folks like me coming in there and fishing for them uh, during during this uh, uh, period of, of, uh, of, of COVID. So uh, to speak to us about that, he is a director with the municipality of Port Hope, uh, Department of Parks, Recreation and Culture. Uh, his name is Jim McCormick. Hey, Jim. Hey, guys. Good. good. How are you? Good, good. good. Um, so first of all, uh, let's talk about what happened uh, early in the year with the steelhead run. That you know, I'll be honest with you. I was a I was a kid. I remember my dad taking me there to to see this this phenomenal run of steelhead that you folks had in the town of Port Hope. Um, so it's been around for at least fifty five years. I'm going to say I'm thinking somewhere in that area, but but. In 2020, I believe for the first time, uh, you guys shut it down. Opening season was not available for anglers to come and uh, and experience it. How did it go? Uh, <clears throat> it actually went quite well. Um, we were quite um, quite pleased that um, you know visitors coming to our community respected the decision of council to close access to municipal properties that border the river. Um, I would say it probably didn't go over quite as well with our residents um, because unfortunately they weren't able to access our trails and, and those specific parklands. Right. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was a matter of <clears throat> ensuring that we didn't have large crowds traversing up and down our trails. And there are areas along our trails where you could access the river uh, and be on federal property, <clears throat> excuse me, where, you know, we really wouldn't have a say in it. So that was the decision that was made. Um, but, you know, when you explained it, residents, they understood and they, and they appreciated it. Um, but it was a fairly short closure. It was only, I think it was about three weeks. Uh, and we, were, we, we reopened the, the parks and, and people have been out enjoying it ever since. Hey, Jim, but you, you mentioned, a, so I want to see if you talk to the people or got a feel for the people about comparing. Yeah, we're pissed off that you took away our walking areas, and our, but you're not letting all these other people come in to put the possible spread. Was there a balance there? They said, yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll give up my little walking area for a bit because you are doing the right thing. Did you get that kind of a comparison or were there, were there some people that just said, why are you doing this? Why? No, I'm, absolutely. The majority of people, I mean, some people just didn't understand perhaps, um, but, but I spoke to a lot of people or whether it was on the phone or via email. And once you explained to them, you know, the intent and the purpose of what we were doing and why, they understood and, and um, you know, we, we certainly have other opportunities for people to walk. You know, there's a, a number of other areas where people can walk on our trails. Yeah. Um, and it was a sacrifice that we, you know, we're all making sacrifices when it comes to this uh, pandemic. And, and I think, you know, once people um, talk their way through it, I guess you could say they were a lot more understanding. So, you no, know, our residents were, were actually really understanding, even though you know, their initial reaction, you know, they weren't crazy about not being able to walk the trails in their mind. They're like, well, just block the river, but let us walk the trails. And, you know, one of the analogies I said back to one yeah. individual was a little upset. I said, well, how would you like it if, you know, we allowed fishing on the river, but we didn't allow people to walk the trail. I said, you gotta, we gotta, we've gotta nice. be equitable and fair to all. And, and unfortunately it does mean sacrifices for both. And, and when you explain it in that manner, then, then they were quite, they were really good about it. And I had some great conversations with our residents. So. I, I remember, uh, Jim, um, you know, these these huge crowds um, that would show up in Port Hope or anywhere along the Ganaraska. And, and, and in fact, a lot of a lot of uh, overnight camping and people sleeping in their vans until, you know, the stroke of midnight when it was legal to fish Friday evening at midnight and, and lineups and, and, and three and four deep on the rivers trying to get a rod in the water. So none of that happened this spring. No, none. No, nobody, nobody showed up. I don't even think we issued a ticket, um, which was good. I mean, and, and that wasn't our intent. We don't want to go out and find people um, for, for accessing the property. There might have been a few people who 
claim they didn't know or ducked under the rope, but you know, our bylaw or our police uh, would, would approach them and, and they would leave peacefully and that was it, but you're correct. You know, I, I would say though, to, to be honest, Angelo, that the numbers that we used to have, like when I started here 23 years ago, I remember them setting up tents in Optimus Park, right by Jocelyn Street, by the Molson Street Bridge, on the Monday morning before the opener. Oh. And by Friday afternoon, that park, there was people in the outfield, there was people everywhere. And and it's it slowly kind of died off a little bit. I don't know why, if 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 people are going to other areas or there's there isn't as much interest, but but we actually have it in our parks bylaw because our parks bylaw, there's no camping permitted on any municipal property, but we have an exemption in our bylaw that says on the, for the for the fourth Saturday of the month in April, people can camp in these specific parks. We're one of the few municipalities that permit it um, because we do welcome anglers. You know, for the most for, for during normal times, we welcome our anglers. That's why we have a fish cleaning station, right? And and that's why we promote it through our tourism, as far as you know, Portal being a destination for fishing. I've li I lived in Port Hope uh, for many years, uh, Jim, as you know, and as you know, and the audience might not know. And the opening trout is is as big in that town as anything in any other town. Like, I mean, that is the highlight of the well, year. Um, except, except for uh, float your fanny down to Ganny. I, I agree. That's very popular, too. But I think, and Jim will be able to tell us, I think the opening trout would probably dwarf that. And that's in, in my opinion, with people, no, Flow your fanny. No, yeah. we, flow your fanny. We get about 10,000 people. Really? Yeah. My mistake. What, what about uh, with the opening trout then? What would you get for that? Uh, it's probably in the, it's hard to say. I, I would say probably in and around a thousand for that weekend. Wow. Ish. By the way, in that range. Right now. now we're talking, yeah. okay. I'm maybe that's modern. I'm day. talking I'm modern, modern day, modern day back, you know, 20 now. years ago, Pete. Yeah, it was, oh, it was a lot busier. I you know, then you're probably in the three, four, five thousand people on that river fishing. Oh, for sure. yeah. For those of you who are not familiar with what we're talking about, go online and check it out. It's called Float Your Fanny Down the Ganny. It is, it is uh, a must do. It's a bucket list deal. It is. That does not involve a whole lot of skill. Some folks might say it doesn't involve a whole lot of brain matter. But it is, without question, one of the most fun-filled events anywhere in Canada. And anybody can come in and, and participate. So I'll give you a tip. Rent or buy a wetsuit. Because if you do it and you don't have a wetsuit, because me and my buddies, the first year we did it, we didn't have wetsuits. Ah, let's just go and give her. My God, we have never been so cold in our lives. All of us in that whole rap were like, what in the hell is so, so fun about this? But once we yeah. look and this and this year for the first time since 1981 that event was canceled oh. wow yeah. yeah such a shame yeah. such a shame for sure so. all right so that's behind us now let's move down first of all i'm assuming it was considered to be a success i mean as much as you can you know say canceling a, a, a an event like that is successful but in terms of health did it have the the results that you were looking for uh absolutely i mean the objective was to to um to uh, basically restrict people from coming to our community and and uh, spending time in our community so from that perspective yes it did work um really uh, the anglers themselves even them they were you know they understood they were you know they didn't like it uh, and i don't blame them i wouldn't like it either but um but they understood and so I, I would say, yes, it was a success to achieve the objective. The numbers in Port Hope have remained very low um, and in Northumberland County, for that matter. Um, I know there was a recent case just last week uh, in Northumberland County in, in our area, but um, the numbers have remained low throughout the pandemic in this area. OK, how was how the, uh, how is the, uh, the uh, social media backlash? Did you get lambasted at all? Well, maybe not so much me, but um, certainly councils, um, there's a lot of uh, very negative comments uh, on there about council and their decision making. A lot of people questioning council's authority um, to do so, but it's very clear in the Municipal Act, the council has the right to govern uh, and, and pass bylaws with respect to use of their properties. 
Right. You know, no different than we restrict other things on, in parkland. You know, we don't permit people to practice golf, as an example. Um, so they they certainly do have that authority, and they've exercised it. And um, I know a lot of people think it's an overreaction, um, but but for anybody who's been in Portal, particularly in the last, you know, especially in the last five or six years, um, it, it it is unbelievable how many people are in our community, especially on the weekends. We're oh. talking thousands and thousands of people. And I want to make something really clear because there's been a lot of people saying they're picking on fishermen. They don't like anglers. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Oh you know, we, we've been working for the last five years to try to address some of the illegal and unethical behaviors. And Angelo, you and I talked about it on the radio about four years ago. And we have a working group with representatives from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, the Conservation Authority, our local portal police and staff to, to try to address the issues through increased enforcement. Um, our portal police service are now um, trained to, to um, enforce the Fisheries Act and the fishing regulations in Ontario. We set aside $8,000 a year in the, in the police budget to provide dedicated patrols on the river on with a focus on the weekends. And that's all those officers do is walk up and down that river, they check licenses and they're looking for any illegal behaviors. Um, and we partner with the MNRF on that same MNRF on that same initiative. We've had the OFH and the MNRF um, setting up display booths in our downtown core um, to educate um, the public and the anglers on, you know, on, on the life cycle of the salmon, the purpose of the salmon as to why they're here, because we all know they're not, uh, they're not uh, native to Lake Ontario, that we're stocked for the purpose of sport fishing, but also trying to, you know, educate people on practicing ethical behavior when it comes to fishing. So we've, we've put a lot of time and effort and energy into this program. Um, but to be quite frank, the purpose of doing this isn't just the anglers. Because I would argue with anybody that we get even more, um, I'll call them fish viewers or tourists that come and all they're coming to do is watch the fish. That's it. They walk up and down our trails. They look at the, the pools, especially the shallow pools downtown, and they congregate um, all through our community. We, we had 48 tour buses register with the municipality last year for the month of September alone. And that's just the ones that register. Wow. Yeah. And, and then you've got the, the people that come by vehicle, and it it is it is packed. For and a, that was the concern. For a child, you know, I'm going to say between the ages of four and ten, I think there is no more memorable experience than standing on the on the banks of the Ganaraska River, right at the uh, at the ladder at the fish ladder, and watching those fish jump into the baskets. In the okay. I don't think there's anything more um, memorable in a child's uh, uh, mind than seeing that happen for the first time. And it is absolutely breathtaking. And that's where I got my first taste of it was mm -hmm. as a kid in awe, watching those magnificent fish jumping up the waterfall. And it, it was incredible. And so yeah. you're absolutely right. It's not just about the catching. There's so much more that that fishery gives us that we kind of take for granted you know correct, correct. And by the way i was just thinking as you were talking i was just thinking too and i and let's make something perfectly clear port hope and 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 council and 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 mnrf and and the off and everybody else who's who's putting all this effort into to police that fishery and um and educate people um, the unfortunate part is that it's a small percentage of the angling community that makes that necessary because by and large, most anglers are law abiding, uh, caring conservationists, wildlife managers in their own right. And they understand all of these things, but it's always that small percentage. It's the same as social media. It's the same as the backlash. It's always a small percentage that are the most vocal that seem to get all the attention seem to get, all of the oil um, on the on the axle, and then that's the unfortunate part, really, because most people, I think, respect what you folks have got in Port Hope with this fishery. You know, in in my opinion, this is just my personal opinion. 
It, generally speaking, you're correct. Uh, in these certain circumstances, it is a small percentage that basically ruins it for the rest. But I have to say, I walk that river on weekends and, and you know, when I'm off, I walk when I'm working. And it's not, I, I'm afraid to say it's not a small percentage of people that are abusing that fishery. It's, it's a much larger percentage than a lot of people might, might think. I mean, we've seen people, we've seen people netting the fish. I've seen people just walk in the water and, and literally grab them by the tail and drag them out and throw them in their cooler. Um, you know, gutting the, gutting the fish in our library parking lot and, and taking the row and leaving the carcass either in, in, you know, on the, on the park. Um, we found carcasses in the porta potties, the extra porta potties that we rent every year. Oh my God. We found them in the bushes. We found them on private property, and I've seen it. And there are a ton of great anglers that come here and fish, and they, they respect the rules and abide the rules. But there is still a fairly large number of individuals that come here and abuse the fishery, and it's it's a sad thing to watch. I, I don't understand why. Um, in the in the trout season, that it's the exact opposite. Yeah, you you would rarely, if at all, see somebody in there that's that's behaving in that type of manner. The, 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 the trout fishermen are extremely respectful and respectful of our community. But when it comes to the salmon and the garbage that's left behind, the, the fishing line, um, it's, you know, I wish I wish you were right, but in my opinion, uh, it's, a, it's a much larger number perhaps than what a lot would think. You know, there's, and, probably, there's a, probably a comparison to uh, in the spring, steelhead in the spring, you've had all these hardcore really dedicated anglers have been waiting all year for this opener, right? Now mm -hmm. trans transfer that into the fall where they've been fishing all year. Now they've done their steelhead, they've done their walleye, they've done their bass. Now the anticipation isn't so strong. So they could say, I don't want to go to that salmon. There's too many other people in there anyways. There's already too many of these Lugans that are doing this kind of stuff to begin with. So I might not even say, so you probably got a way less percentage, I'm guessing, of hardcore ardent law-abiding anglers uh, that are salmon fishing than there than you have in the spring for the steelhead, mm -hmm. right? Which and right. that is because I I'll guarantee you the lawbreakers in the spring that are fishing steelhead are not fishing; they're poaching steelhead are going to get crucified if not beat up by the the good anglers out there. They're going to say, "Hey, pal, get the hell off this!" Or I'm going to call you in and all like that. Well, there's if that a lot lesser of that is happening in the fall, then these guys can get away with it too, unfortunately, right? So. Yeah, and you know, perhaps it's just the attitude of you know, well, the fish are going to die anyway, so who cares? Sure. And That's they treat them that way. I mean, I've seen. I caught. I saw a guy last year snag one in the back. He dragged it in, and he and he took the hook out, and he was going to put it in his cooler. And I was standing there. I said, "Buddy, you you snagged that fish. You got to let it go." And I got no speak English, and and I said, "Excuse me, sir. You have to put that fish back." And you know what he did? He had the fish holding up in the air. He dropped it down on the rocks, and he kicked it into the river. Oh and this is the kind of stuff that our residents see all the time. Staff see it all the time. Yeah. And 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 I don't know why this lack of respect for for a species of fish that's going to go up and produce more salmon for exactly. people to enjoy for generations to come. Yeah. It boggles my mind that that attitude, for whatever reason, with the salmon exists. It just, it, yeah, it's just it's it's speechless. I think it has a lot to do with what you guys just talked about, you know, the sustainability of of the creature. A steelhead are self-sustaining. They, they re re reproduce uh, themselves, whereas we know salmon aren't doing that. It's a put-and-take fishery. It's almost like Except a, in the Gany. Except, except in the Ganaraska. They do I, not stock salmon in heaven for, what, 30 yeah, years, 25 I, years? I heard yeah. of, don't know that. Yeah. By and large, the perception is that salmon are not self-sustaining, right? They're, yep. It's take fishery, it's there for our enjoyment, right? And we can do whatever the hell we want with it. And therefore it's attracting a different type of, of user. I agree. And and uh, that is a problem. So yep. so so let's talk about what you guys are, are suggesting or what you're actually doing. I mean, you're doing it, by the way, one of the problems you're going to have if you haven't already encountered it, uh, and I'm reading some of the messaging on the side here, you, I know you're encountering some problems, um, is that it's one thing to do it in the spring of, of 2020 when the entire planet is on the verge of shutting down and we have this unknown monster that is preparing to attack us called COVID-19 and we just don't feel safe, let's hunker down. 
that's fine, although it wasn't fine. You got some backlash too, but but at least it was acceptable. Now the problem is that according to our chief medical officer, um, we're okay, and we in fact we can assemble in in larger groups, and in fact we are in stage three, and we can go to restaurants, and we can do all of these things. So I can kind of understand why you'd get some backlash now because they're saying okay enough is enough you did it in the spring and we bought in and we're fine we got through but don't do it now when the whole province is a seemingly wide open mm -hmm. that would be your problem i yeah. think yeah yeah you're you're absolutely correct um but as much as our health officials are saying you know hey we're in stage three we can we can start to loosen restrictions we're still not out of the woods and that's been made very clear by the health like we need to be vigilant, a diligent, sorry, and we need to continue to ensure that people are practicing safe social distancing and, and following all the guidelines of Health Canada. We're seeing an uptick already in Ontario now um, over the last week and a half. And knowing full well that um, from what the health uh, officials are telling us that the likelihood of a second wave this fall in September is extremely high with the kids, especially with the kids going back to school, yeah, you know these are all the the, the deciding factors in, in why Port Hope looked at that. But we're not talking about the spring trout fish with a few hundred anglers. We're, we're literally talking about thousands and thousands of people descending on Port Hope. And council didn't matter what decision council made. It, it, they knew that it, the decision that they made was not going to be popular, and that people were going to be upset one way or another. I provided a report to council and said, look, here's here's your op options and you need to provide staff direction. And one is basically status quo um, and and close the fish ladder off because the, the conservation authority had already indicated they wanted to do that. Uh, and status quo, when we would put extra signage up and we would put, have a public awareness campaign as far as, you know, if you're coming to Port Old, make sure you wear a mask and social distance and do all of those things. Or a council, your other option is 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 do what we did in the spring and shut it down. So that was that was two of the recommendations. But the third recommendation was that we we open it up for the public, and we we allow the public to to provide their input and their comments. And so we did that, and that that public consultation period was open for a month because council wanted to get a gauge of the community and what their reaction was, and if the comments we received. You know, we did we did uh, the where people could write in, and we received about 185 comments, and 62 percent of them said shut it down. And I read every single comment, and people were saying, you know what, it it, it sucks that I can't walk on the trail. Um, I don't like that, but I get it, and we want to keep our community safe. We don't want to promote the spread. We also did a bang your table um, poll, and we had over 200 210 responses, and again, 70 percent of the respondents said shut it down. So council looked at all of that, um, and and they had a tough decision. They they I know speaking to individual members of council and the mayor himself, they struggled with this one. Like it, it's a tough call, but I think in the end, from their perspective, they they just didn't. Um, uh, and listening to the residents, that there was just concern that um, we are still in a pandemic, no matter how you cut it, and and this probably is not the right time to be inviting people to come to our community and in such large numbers. And, and and in the end, that was a decision that they made. And I mean, last weekend was a prime example. They, whether it's a member of council counted 250 people down on the East Pier within a stretch of 200 meters. 250 people in 200 meters. <laughs> and that's the problem. That's right? the problem. And that's right you know, there. Not you'll never know it, but by making this decision, you could be avoiding uh, a near catastrophe right you're not not a catastrophe we'll say but it, and unfortunately you can't tell because you're taking precautions to stop it but the what if you know what if you didn't do that and all of a sudden a, a number of infected people came into the community and it went into the stores and bought the coffees and bought the gas and did all this kind of stuff and whatever they did and they forgot to wear a mask and all that you could have your numbers up higher than you've ever seen you know in, in an entire the entire pandemic so far in a a week's time or two weeks time so you are making the right decision i mean you gotta you gotta kind of be safe here right you gotta this is this is an odd situation so scary uh, it, 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 it's a tough one 
all you have to do is start reading some of these messages that we're getting here, and and you see that there's a real mixed opinion on what you just said, Pete. I mean, there's people are saying, hey, you know, it was just announced. There's a vaccine going to be ready in a matter of weeks. Like we're 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 overdoing this whole thing. We we got vaccines in place. We're going to be okay. Let us do our thing. There's still a lot, and and you know, they may be. By the way, I'm not suggesting that's wrong or or right. I'm just yeah. pointing out. That thinking may be solid. It may be the right thinking, but but you know, or maybe you don't know, Jim. We took I particularly took an awful lot of heat the same time you were getting shot. I know you did. I read it shot from the back. Okay, so I I'm very familiar with 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 how quickly this thing can turn and get ugly real fast. But you know, we've now here we are five months later. You know, we've we're 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 still discussing: is it real? Is it not real? Uh, is it safe? Is it not safe? Do we have a cure? Do we not have a cure? Uh, are masks really hurting, or is it a hindrance to this whole yeah. process? There's the same questions that were there five months ago are still there now. So I so many unknowns. Yep. Yeah, I can understand the emotions that that go through this this process and why people will make comments like I'm seeing here now um, about this. I'm not. Um, however, you know, I still stand with the position that that we took early in the year and that you took uh, uh, in May in April, whenever it was, um, and that is that for the sake of this one season, for the sake of this one little personal satisfaction that we get from doing an event like the opening of, of, of Steelhead on the Ganny or or the fall salmon run on the Ganny, you know, for, for the sake of that one moment where, where it's greed, I, you know, listen, I fish because I'm greedy. I fish because I love what I feel when I'm out there doing these things. I love being there. So if that's not greed, then I don't know what is. I'm not doing it for you, Jim. I don't go fishing for you. No. I'm going fishing for me. So yep. as far as I'm concerned, th th that's greed. I do it because I love it. I love how I feel. I love that that passion that drives me to go fishing. So it's it's greed. So my thinking is for this one time, this is the only time this has ever happened in history, I'm willing to take a break and say, on the right, I don't know. I have no idea. But I know that if I take a more cautious approach, I should have better results when it's, yeah. when it's over. So that's kind of the way I look at it. But having said that, I can understand what, what, what they're saying there. I can, I, I'm can i reading comments. You know, I understand that, hey, that was then in the spring. Now is now. What the hell are you doing? Yeah. Right? Yeah, but you know, and like I said, council had they had a really tough decision to make, and and either whatever decision they made wasn't gonna they were gonna take heat. They knew that, and and um, but I think in the end that they're listening to their to the taxpayers of Port Hope, the residents that that they're here to serve, and and it was it, when you looked at that sixty two percent, it was an even higher percentage of Port Hope residents of that that were the ones saying you know shut it down. So. Um, that that was all part of that deciding factor. So, and you know, I actually found it interesting, Angel. I don't know if you saw this, but there's been a lot of comments on social media. Well, why not control the numbers? Yeah. And I said, like, well, how are we supposed to do that? Yeah. yeah, with thousands of people descending on our community, and again, not just the fishermen, the tourists that come too, but there's even people saying they should have a fish uh, pay to fish. And I'm like, really? Because the last time we had this discussion on this radio station, you know, that, that came back loud and clear. The, the angling community were like, absolutely not, no way. And council said, okay, we won't implement it. But yeah. it, I, it's, it's, it's I, a I, tough I, one. I did read one thing that was very interesting, though. I got to tell you, and I bought into it. I thought, yes, I could do this. And that was a lottery. Yeah. That was a lottery, you know, a pandemic lottery where, where you, you know, people would have to submit – and then, and then you would pick out whether it's done for the for the for, uh, on a daily basis or whether it's done on a weekly basis or maybe even for the entire season, but there would be a lottery pick of, of only a certain number of people that would be able to fish the Ganaraska River in 2020. Wouldn't that be cool? I, I thought it was a great idea, but potentially, but, and you know, maybe that's something we look at the future as far as trying to control the numbers that come, but. Um, 
I, I don't know. Again, it goes back to the tourism piece. Uh, it comes to the people that aren't fishing. They just come to watch the fish. And how do you how do you manage that? How do you stop a, a tour bus from pulling off the 401 and and coming into our community? It's it's a tough yeah, you one. You can't run a lottery for that. That's for sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think in the future, if this is going to carry on much farther, I think you're going to have to use common sense. Yeah. I think you stop a busload of tourists with kids or elderly people who have come to experience this phenomenon called, you know, the Ganaraska fish ladder. I don't think you can stop them. I don't think you should stop them. I think I think they should be allowed to do that. Right. Yeah. Those aren't your problem. Those people aren't your problem. If by and large, if you can contain them in that one area, it's not like they're walking up and down the river and 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 mingling with with everybody. There's a very specific area that they're going to be uh, going to to experience this. You almost have to keep them. You have to let them do. I don't know. It's my you opinion. Can't, you can't contain them 100. percent If you have local no. kids in the river that are doing something and they're all mingling, and all of a sudden this bus is everybody gets infected because they're all together in the spot, and then just brings more into Port Hope too. So well, and those tour those tourist buses don't just go to the fish ladder. They'll go there first, and then they'll come downtown and park downtown at Lakeland Place beside exactly. Town Hall, and exactly. then they'll walk up and down through the shallows, you know, from Rotary Bridge up to yep. Ontario Street, which is we all know is fantastic viewing as far as those pools, and you can watch yep. them going from one pool to the next to the next to the next. So it's, it, yeah, it, it's a it's a tough oh, one. It really yeah. is. Economically more beneficial, Jim. The spring sam or spring steelhead or the fall salmon in the last couple of years. Which more economically be beneficial? Is there one over the other? Um, probably. I would. I would assume the salmon, just because the sheer volume of people is is much higher than than the than the spring run. Okay. So I would think it's that. Um, yeah. We haven't had. Uh, we've only had one business that's that's complained as far as. Um, the decision the council made to close down, which which I did find a little interesting. Um, mm. It's it's hard to gauge the tourism money that's spent, um, not just from anglers, but the tourists that do come. Yep. We know our foot traffic is at its highest number in the month of September through our downtown core. Um, but even right now, as of right now, our numbers are up about 20% as far as foot traffic, but our marketing and tourism departments contributing maybe some of that to at least, you know, a lot of residents are staying home. You know, right. a staycation and 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 in maybe exploring through the downtown. It's hard to say um, what that impact is. Huh. Interesting. You know, the province is going to have a difficult time uh, moving forward for. I mean, not just because of the pandemic itself, but I think they're certainly in northern Ontario, northwestern Ontario in particular, and I think to some extent here in the south as well. Uh, we're finding out just how big this thing is that we call fishing. We're finding how we're finding out how important it is. You know, in some communities, it's the economic engine that drives the whole deal. In northwestern Ontario, fishing is, in some cases, seventy-five percent of the income of a community is attributed to fishing. Pandemic has put the spotlight on this, and I yeah. think moving forward, I think in the future, it, 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 you know, it augurs well for the fishing industry. Because there's going to be a little more attention paid to it down the road by governments in general, because it's a big, big part of our economy. Sure. And, you know, obviously, you guys are no exception to that. Uh, it has been for years in uh, in Port Hope. So, um, you've got an interesting uh, conundrum on your hands, my friend. <laughs> I don't uh, envy you. I think as we well, we have we have closed we have closed the parkland. It's all been closed off. Done. Okay. Um, so we did we did initiate that on um, I guess it was on Wednesday, right so after council. Here's the problem. You know, moving forward, you're going to get a lot of heat. I can tell right now. You guys are under fire, and uh, you're going to get a lot of heat from here on in. And you're going to do uh, the best to uh, to uh, zig and zag and, and dodge and all that stuff. But my biggest concern is, what do we do in the spring now? What good question. Good question. We actually had a letter from our float your fanny down the Ganey committee asking the same thing because they want to start planning and they go, what do we do? And I, I wish I had that crystal ball to say, wow, nobody know. has that crystal ball right now, boys. Nobody nope. has that. Nope. Wow. Worldwide, I don't huh? think until there's a vaccine. Yeah, exactly. 
And even yeah. that, who knows, right? I mean, how many people get involved with it? It's According to some of our astute uh, audience members, uh, that vaccine is here and, and, and we'll be using it in November. So There was somebody that said, don't don't bet your last dollar on it. They, they, they already had it. As soon as somebody said that, the next guy said, yeah, okay, go ahead. Let's see how that happens. Let's see how that works out for you. So. Uh I'll leave it up to you, Jim. Uh, if you would like to answer some of these questions, you you feel free. Uh, we we certainly have no issues with it. Uh, if not, I, I totally am cool too. I understand we didn't bring you on. Uh, this is not a traveling uh, you know road show that we want to uh, bring out uh, our our caged uh, sideshow uh, members and expose them to the audience by any means. But but you know if, if you feel um, that that you would like to address any of it you're it's it's entirely up to you sure and, yeah uh, i'll do know. my best mike i already get them now i already get them now right so uh, I've mike, emails uh, multiple emails uh so jean luc uh, marion uh, says maybe i missed it but has anyone asked about surrounding communities like colberg uh, to my knowledge, Coburg, uh, Coburg Town Council hasn't made the same decision as Port Hope. Uh, so the best of my knowledge, Coburg Creek's open uh, on public space. But, but it's not an issue. Coburg is not an issue. I would answer that by saying they don't have the Ganaraska flowing through. No. Right? Uh, and, and, and that's the problem. I, I don't think there's many communities, maybe the credit, maybe the credit that would maybe. be comparable yeah. in yeah. terms of size. Uh, I don't even think Bowmanville or or Oshawa are anywhere even in the same discussion as that Ganaraska. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you can look at in in Port Hope, right east of the Ganaraska is Gages Creek. It's a nice little creek for for trout and salmon, et cetera, et cetera. They won't have to shut that down because it's a tiny no. it's, it's a tiny trip. The Ganaraska River. To anybody that doesn't know about the Ganaraska, is the number one. Uh, salmon and trout tributary in all of Ontario. Basically, it's huge. It's a the numbers of fish. I mean, the Saugeen, I guess there, there's a few of them that are that yeah. are. Huge. The credit's got a lot of fish, but that that Ganny is an unbelievable avenue for these fish to go up every spring and fall. Yeah, I think I think the number is ten thousand that go through the ladder every year. That's so here's on the Ganny. Here's a difference with those three rivers that you just mentioned. Okay, so so the credit, you know. Um, arguably gets a larger salmon run. I say yeah. arguably. Yeah. The Saugeen gets a larger, according to Daryl, my good friend Daryl, gets a larger steelhead run, but there is not a river in this province. In Got fact, it. I would say there's not a river in this country that gets the combination of steelhead and salmon through it that the Ganaraska does. Right. No. Exactly. And, and, that I, I defy anybody to make an argument with that. So it's a very unique, very unique fishery, very unique uh, piece of water that that you can't compare to anything else we've got. There's exactly, no and don't ever and, na and naturally reproducing and yeah. that's reproducing. I mean, and and look at the the last ditch effort with the Atlantic salmon program, and they've got Atlantics coming up the Gammy. Don't get me started on Atlantics, okay? Now you're going to get me started in something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else we got? You know what? Well, even, uh, even the like, brown throat run that goes up the Ganny, I've caught yep. largemouth bass at the mouth of the Ganny. There's smallmouth. The carp fishing in there is incredible. That's just a phenomenal fishery. That whole river is unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, Calvin wants to know how well uh, will these bans be enforced and who will enforce them? What are the plans to curtail non-compliance? Now, you, you just told us that you only hit, you think you had one non-compliance uh, issue in the spring. Yep. Uh, how are you forecasting the fall? Well, this morning we had to ask a few people to leave a specific area, but uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, they cooperated. Um, so it will be enforced by municipal bylaw enforcement, uh, but as well as the portal police. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the, the dedicated paroles on the weekends, patrols, and they're going to they're going to do that for at least for the first couple of weeks just to to see how it goes. Um, but, um, you know, unless somebody's really giving them a hard time, it'll it'll simply be a warning and just ask them to move on. We don't like we don't want to go out and find people. I mean. It, it, there's no advantage to the municipality. A lot of people think, oh, you guys are doing it for the money because you're going to get the bylaw money. 
Well, a lot of people don't know. We get very, very little of that money because it's a provincial offense. Right. The province gets the majority of the cut of that fine. And then the, the upper tier municipality, the county gets a big cut. And the municipality of Port Hope gets a little teeny little bit of that $150 fine for trespassing. So they're, you know, we, we that's not the business that we want to be in and, and being hard nosed. We would rather just educate people and just ask them to please cooperate. I think, Jim, you should put on all your hockey gear and, and uh, helmet on there and just go down and start hacking them with a the stick. You're just saying, get the hell off our property. Get out of here. <laughs> 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 Adding to the problem. Um, Jody has got a, a very interesting point. Uh, maybe we can put that up, Mike. Um, he says, also, I read that only the East Pier was to be closed, but I got kicked off the West Pier this morning, and then the road was barricaded. Maybe you mm -hmm. can so the but the the there was there was I had I had made a statement and it was and it was it was my fault I messed up I'm about the West Pier and just maybe call it a long week if you want to call it that as far as when I answered that question but the bylaw does state all municipal properties along the Ganaraska River the West Pier is municipal property it is part of the Ganaraska River so that area is closed so that for that individual I'm sorry. I'll apologize. I apologized to another gentleman um, the other day because I did make that statement. But like I said, I'm just going to chalk it up as a long day. And I was tired when I made that statement. But it, it does include that particular area. I've got, I'll throw one before we get to another one, Mike. Um, you're you're talking about your access to these waterways, to this waterway. Um, how about if somebody wants to use as much of the navigable portion of the Ganaraska via watercraft and for the purpose of fishing. How, they were how doing that this morning. Yeah, there's people in kayaks this morning and boats. There's nothing we can do about it. Our boat launch is open. We kept it open. So okay. people want to launch a boat or a kayak and paddle up. That's, that's their prerogative. There's nothing we can do about it, nor will we. There you go. It's no. just the access. It's just the access to our municipal properties. That's and there, all. And there's a huge fall fishery for the guys, for the people that have lake boats that just go drop out and go into the mouth of the lake and start working out there. Because right now those salmon are staging right there. There's a huge fishery going on right now. Right? They're all correct. There. And That's correct. Boats yeah. Boats get launching all the time. Um, it's actually something Angie and I've been talking about doing. So we wouldn't mind doing it this year just to to get out there and uh, and and try that shallow water salmon fishing with kind of uh medium action gear and have to chase your fish you know what i mean it's pretty yep. cool fishery too in itself yeah so. um do we want to address the uh question from chris uh mike chris, uh, so uh will the ban be in effect for the winter months as well or just salmon run popular time the bands until october the 15th so October 15th, and then you can do whatever you want. Well, back to normal. Back and we, yeah, and we gauge that, you know, just based on the history, with, again, the tourists. Like, the, the Ganaraska closes September 30th, right? North of the viaducts, it closes September 30th. But we kept it till October 15th because that's still that prime tourist season as far as right. the people coming to watch. So October 15th would be the last day, and then we'll, we'll reopen everything. Because there, the, there's another one that's interesting for people listening that don't know the, the Ganaraska River. The, the guys will fish it right up until ice, and then when it ice is over, once it gets steady enough for ice, they go right. They up ice fish. Over. They ice fish right there for steelhead, and it's crazy. What? And they get some beauties that drill a hole through that ice. The current, their bait's going down this way, and all of a sudden, boom! They're pulling up a ten-pound steelhead through a hole, and they're in five That's feet of true. water. Anglers, yeah. anglers are very resourceful people. We'll figure it out. And there's a lot of them. Hardcore. Uh, oh say, yeah. Uh, oh, he yeah. thinks imagine people will flock to those other areas the lesser popular uh, areas and, and try their luck in those uh, waterways um, you know maybe they don't have as many salmon but it's going to increase the yep. foot traffic on those smaller waterways which it probably will um, yeah, yeah. and hey it could i i live on shelter valley road yeah um so shelter valley creeks right across the road from my house yeah and i still haven't seen anybody fishing it yet surprisingly okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's be honest. We were just talking about it. that. That Chinook salmon run in the fall in the Ganaraska River is world class. 
Mm-hmm. There are so many big, I mean, I've experienced it. I live there, I guess. And I do the same thing. I go down and watch them a lot of times. Just watch these 30 pound fish. So you see 20 or 30 of them in one school uh, sitting in one pool there is that a 30 pound fish. It's like, oh my God, is this for real? You know, and, yeah. and there's just pods of them that come in and come in and come in and come in. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible fishery. So they're, they're, I mean, there's numbers there, that's for sure. So these other little, the Shelter Valley, for instance, Oshawa Creek, for instance, they got them, but they don't have anything like that in numbers. Yeah. Okay, what else you got, Mike? That's worth looking at. Uh, I'm rooting for Canada. Oh, okay, good. I have my first trip scheduled to Hawk Lake. Yes, Hawk Lake. Hopefully, you get uh, uh, through through uh, Teddy, who comes on this site quite a bit. He might be on with us today. Um, Hawk Lake. Wow. There you go, Michael. Out of boy, you're gonna love it. If I mean you booked it now, hopefully Ted. I mean Ted is one of the guys that closes lodge down for the whole season. Uh, you know, there's a, there are some that did, some that didn't. If you go to if that trip goes through me and Michael, you are gonna love it. You are gonna have a great time. You're gonna catch giant walleye you're gonna have small mouth, and if you want pike and lake trout, if you want to go to the back lakes, you're in, buddy. It's gonna be. Good. Way, we've been talking to Ted uh, throughout this ordeal because he he did make it up to Hawk Lake. Um, um, this year, but he kept it closed, as Pete just said. So uh, himself and his senior staff have been going out, and you know it's a perfect time for them. They've never had this opportunity before to go out and actually fish their lake without you know the pressure of having guests on it. And he's saying they're, they're finding all kinds of interesting oh, yeah. new things that they didn't know about Hawk Lake and and the fishery. So there's yeah. some side to this. What's your opinion of that, uh, Jim? Um, with the closure in the spring, uh, do you think there uh, we're going to see some residual effects on the fishery, on the steelhead fishery in the Gany? Well, I, I think that logic would say yes, right? If if there weren't as many um, um, that were caught and kept or or disturbed from their spawning area, then you would think that there would be a benefit. Same with the salmon. Um, that it, more than make it up upstream to spawn, you know, it's it's just going to in, increase numbers. And and it will work for next year too because the, all those same fish that could drop back and made it back to the lake, they never got caught going up or coming down. They will have a successful spawn next this year. More fish will have a chance to have a successful spawn. Yeah. This year. So. Did the MNR, um or whoever was in charge of the program? I know, and there's a certain element that is. Uh, um, not MNR uh, managed. Um, were we still putting the same number of fish up over the dam and through the other side? Did, did the same number of fish make it through to their uh, traditional spawning grounds as in previous years? To the best of my knowledge, yes, but I, I'm I can't confirm that. I'm I uh, that would be a question I'd have to ask my good friend Jason White, who's been a volunteer at that fishway for I think forty years now. So. He, he, he would probably have that answer. He's probably watching this right yeah. now, so maybe yeah. he'll type. Maybe he'll type that answer for you because he he's the guy that would know exactly uh, how many fish were were taken up, um, you know, year in and year out. They see there's a, a there's a gang on our list right now. There's a gang, but he, headed by a guy named Hunter Bowman, I believe, and he's got a few other guys. Christian is on there, and I think Mason's on there. So, uh, my boy, my oldest boy, and his uh, and his buddies are on here watching us now too. Hey lads, what's going on? Glad, I'm glad they came in. If you, I mean, get your friends to come in here too. You know what I mean? Subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're at it, boys. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Doug uh, Tarbot uh, is saying that we need to go fish steelhead near Bella Coola. Uh, one of the, yeah, on the Dean River, the famous Dean River. That I've heard about that. Yeah, you're right. He's right. We should go out there and and, uh, and fish that. From what I, world class, and that's and those are good out there too, right? Um. Okay. I think we're just about. There's more questions here. Um. But I, and I don't mean to cut you off, but we are at uh, two o'clock. Uh, we're supposed to be. We can we can send people to our website, which has uh, an article, a quick article, and it also links to Jim's website as well. So if you want, you can leave comments on ours. Jim can probably stay in touch with you through that through our site, or you can get a hold of Jim through their website as well. So it'd be a nice way to, to keep this going. You give your opinions, you have your high fives if you like it, et cetera, et cetera, and you can stay in touch with Jim on that. So. 
Uh, Jim, want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, you were very gracious with your time, and we do appreciate it. Uh, I, 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 I won't say I know what you're going through, but I had a bit of an inkling of it myself earlier in the year, so I, I kind of know what to, how it feels. Uh, you, you think you're doing the right thing. You think you're you got it all under control on top of it, and then you find out that a lot of people don't necessarily agree. Um, wrong, right, or indifferent, you're making a stand. The town of Port Hope is making a stand, which is very cool because um, I think it's very significant. I think 2020 is the year that we we all uh, took a step back and uh, did hopefully did our part to see if we could get through this crap. And 21 will, I certainly hope, uh, be a lot different. I certainly hope... I will have an opportunity to go to the Ganaraska River in, in April uh, of this coming 2021 and bring my grandkids there to see this phenomenal and experience this phenomenal thing called the steelhead of the Ganaraska River. And uh, and I wish you all the best of luck, my friend. And uh, let's, let's stay in touch. Uh, uh, as Pete said, we will try and funnel as many of the questions and queries that we get due to this particular episode onto you, and maybe you can address them. And, and um, let people know it's not the end of the world. Uh, we just correct need to make some changes temporarily. Yep, yep. exactly. Oh, well, thanks well, for joining us, my friend. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate your support, and I appreciate you having me on the show. It was great. All right. Anytime. All right. You take care, man. Yep, you too. Uh, Jim McCormick uh, from the town of Port Hope. Port Hope, Ontario. Port yeah. Hope. Uh, I, did a lot, I had a lot of fun in that town, I'll have to tell you, my friend. Not uh, just fish either. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's going to be under heat for, for a little bit, for sure. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? I, I believe they're doing the right thing. It just it, it's just it's a situation where, and when the town speaks, you got to listen too, right? So I, I percentage spoke and told him to shut it down. There's uh, uh, Merv Ellis is saying he, uh, he agrees. Um, on the reasons why Port Hope has taken proper steps to keep out the COVID-19. It's nice to see people taking that approach too. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to pile on right now, isn't it? Oh, God. Pile on to this, this issue especially uh, because it's pretty simple. We, according to the chief medical officer of this province, we're okay. Hell, we're sending our kids back to school. I know there's a, shit, there's a shit showing itself right there, and no, but seriously, we could okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So I can send my kid back to school to mingle with all of the other bacteria carrying children and bring all of that virus home. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, I can't go fish the Ganaraska for a couple of salmon. Like I don't, I don't understand. Who's, who's right and who's wrong in that situation? You know what I mean? The tough one. You hear that, Hunter? You peckerhead? Okay, be careful at school. And your little buddies. I'm going to take a round out of all of you. Well, you're not allowed in my house. That's right. I don't want you to spread COVID around my house. So, what are you getting out? You getting some money out, Viola? Oh, Nick. Nick is here. Nick is here. Speaking, speaking, speaking of kids. kids. Peckerheads. <laughs> What's going on, boy? Take. Um, you can put your hat on sideways, don't you, boy? You need, you okay. need those? Uh, no, I think we're good for now. Okay. I'll Bye see you later. Me. Ciao. Uh, I like well, a little live stream. Stuff like that happens right there. I love this pandemic. I hope, we, you know, in some ways, I hope we stay where we are. It's been it's been such a, a different experience so far. Um, You're a moron. What are you talking about? You know, I don't know. It's been great for the kids, that's for sure. I have to say. They have not hurt. They have not been hurt out of it. That's for sure. So um, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, if if you folks have got anything that you'd like to address with us here on the show, uh, maybe I know why. Mike, play that cool Q and A bumper you got, will you? That's the one. <laughs> I love that. That's you cool. Know why? You know why? Why? It's got me in it. And it, was a, and it was a beautiful shot of you, by the way. Thank you. You know why? Because you took it. <laughs> Booyah! <laughs> uh, one of the rare times I got the DSLR out there and get a half decent shot out of it. For Do sure. you remember uh, that scene? 
Oh my God. That might have been one of the most incredible fishing experiences you and I have ever shared. Oh, it was crazy. It was insane. We probably should, now that we're waiting for a question to come up here, right. um, so, would you explain it to everybody? Lake in Northern Ontario, way out flying thing. I won't, I, I won't mention it because that's not what this, we're not plugging the lake. It's just the experience. So we're on a lake. Wonderful uh, lodge owner is with us, uh, um, you know, and he's kind of showing us around the lake and suggesting, you know, where to shoot the shows and, and all that stuff. But they had had extremely high waters. It was early in the year. It was just, you know, after ice out, the, the waters were extremely high. And so we're running around the lake and, and, and checking stuff out. And quite honestly, nothing's working. <laughs> like nothing is working. Yeah. So at, at one point, we, we uh, had it already prearranged. We were all going to get together and converge and have lunch out on the lake and discuss what our findings were and what the next, you know, strategy was going to be. So we do that and we're, you know, eating our, our sandwiches and, and whatnot. And um, we're, we're desperate. We told them things aren't looking good. <laughs> I don't know whether this is going to happen. So we said, have you got anything else? Like, have you got anything like different? I mean, all these spots that you're talking about are the traditional areas that that have been holding fish, and um, and uh, maybe we just need to sort of go off the beaten path. Have you got anything at all? And he looked, you know, he's very de dejected and and thought about it. Why? Not really. So I did see something kind of weird though on the way up here to meet you guys just now. Um, I, I came around a, a bend on the lake and on this underwater point and stuff, and there was like a billion birds, like gulls and different types of aquatic, you know, birds. They seem to be feeding on this one little area. And Pete and I both looked at each other, what? And he explained that you know birds. nothing about birds. <laughs> That's what we said. <laughs> oh, God. So we hightailed it down there. We got our butts down to the area that that uh, he was talking about. And as we got closer to it, we could see it. We could see it from way up, and it was just a mass, like it was a feeding frenzy, like almost reminiscent of feeding frenzies out in the ocean when the herring and mackerel get balled up to the surface by tuna and, and, and that kind of thing. And it was bizarre what was going on. And we still don't know to this day exactly what was happening, but all I can tell you is for the next three days, every fish, and we're talking walleye, we're talking pike, every fish in the lake had somehow gotten the email or the message or the text <laughs> Whoever and said, All right, everybody down on uh, point X for the next week. It's a feeding frenzy. I want every fish in the lake feeding there because that's what we experienced. And to this day, I've never seen that happen again. Yeah. Um, phenomenal. And they were, it was so bad that these big pike were and walleye were up. They were, they were, it was such a, a mass, it was just a big ball of, of, of wildlife fish and it was so cluttered it was so thick that it forced a lot of the peripheral smaller fish really shallow and they were foraging in like that much water it was so competitive that their fins pike fins all we could see was pike fins and tails in that much water. it was crazy anyways there you go it was it was good so we got some questions out there mike you could probably put up yeah there we go pretty much anything Big cats. Little out of the box, but do you guys fish for big cats? Flathead, big channels. Would you be a great show for a, a hit em gem? Yes, we we have in the past. We've uh, we've fished in Canada. We fished the Red River was the main one for for uh, big channel cats. And Angelo had done it more than I did it once or twice. Angelo done it a bunch of times. And we also shot a show. I shot a show in um, on the Grand River mm -hmm. uh, in Belleville. And there's a great. Uh, cat fishery there too as well and that's very accessible for all the toronto people etc in ontario but that that manitoba red river and we got to get back there but we've always talked about angela keep talking about going back there and it's such a phenomenal fishery a big i mean 20 pound plus 
catfish, like giants that are just sitting there waiting to be caught. So yeah, we've definitely done it. I have a theory about cats. You know, the Red River in particular, the Selkirk Dam is uh, legendary. It's, 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 it's a global phenomenon. People, people go there from, from every parts of the world to fish for these giant cats. But I, I think there are rivers like the Ottawa River. Oh, God. The Niagara River is another one. I think there are rivers that would would rival the red for cats if people would fish for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably right. Just don't. You know, you're people don't want right. to those rivers. In fish yeah, you'd, you'd have to first, I think people would have to start fluking some big cats first. They'd say, oh, geez, there's a 10-pounder, there's a 12-pounder. Wow, what a matter if there's something good going on here, you know what I mean? And then it would be like them to go, hey. Eh? How are you going to flute them? Walleye fishing. With a big chunk of meat? Catfish don't eat just a chunk of fish. But oh, oh okay, yeah. I've, I've caught, on the Bay of Quinty myself, on the Bay of Quinty, I have caught a lot of nice catfish from ice fishing to open water fishing with live bait and even with cranks and spinners. So they will hit that kind of stuff. Usually there's yeah. a bay yeah. presentation. You know yourself, if you go around and, and find those fish, and, and that's and, why that's why I say you got to fluke, that's why you'd have to fluke them first. If you then you start laying in that meat that you're talking about, and then you start fishing them properly, and then you can really open up. I tried, like, I tried the Trent River one time in Trenton. I, I thought, God, this got to be good. I didn't do very well at it, I don't know the river that well. I went up towards the dam part of it and all that, and, and it just didn't set up right. And I didn't fish it, I don't think I fished it properly, and all that. But you're right, there are so many rivers in canada that i'm sure have a great channel cat fishery that it'd be uh what was the other one he said uh flathead or what was it what was flathead. the other one flathead, yeah yeah do, i don't even know if we have flatheads in in canada do we oh we've got giant channels for sure channels. yeah giant channels and bullheads a little you know uh yeah bullhead what do you call them mud cats and stuff like that flathead a ton, of, a ton of fun to me they're right there with carp in terms of underutilized and and tremendous potential in this part of the world, but way underutilized. Yeah, yeah. Merv Mervell says as the water cools down this fall, would you fish points, shoals, or green weeds for walleye? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Exactly. Uh, or or combine that. Ooh, combine that. find the and one structure that has it all, the one piece of cover and structure that has it all. That's a good point, Ange. If, if there's lots of points and everything out there. Find the one with either two or three of those, and you have got yourself the the area of all areas. But all three are very good. Let's be honest; they're you know they're uh, green weeds. If you got green weeds, no matter you're going to catch every species of fish in those green weeds. If it's a good weed bed that's been known to have fish before, come fall, if they're still alive, you're going to catch every species in that green weed bed. And so the most people might be listening and saying, "Okay, guys, let's get serious. How the hell do you find that?" Most lakes have probably got a thousand of those that that you know fit that description. How do you find the ones that are holding the fish? Because that's the biggest question we all have. Let's be honest about it. You know, sometimes we oversimplify it or we make it look too simple by doing these wonderful little illustrations of what to look for. And, and the classic example is what Pete just said now. You know, find that one point that's got all three of those elements and boy, you're going to have a bonanza. But the truth of the matter is that you could find a thousand of those on any given body of water. So now you need to take those and put them in close proximity to where the fish are headed to over the course of the next two or three months. And that is the wintering area, especially walleye. They're going to go to a wintering area on your favorite lake, on any body of water. And, and a lot of times those wintering areas are really obvious if you look at a map and you and you and you put all the puzzles to all the pieces of the puzzle together and you say, whoa, that's a wintering area for sure. And that's a wintering area. So so now look for what we just said, that perfect, you know, three piece puzzle that's closest to a wintering area or on route to a wintering area, and you'll find you'll find those fish for sure. This is the easiest time of the year to find big bunches of fish. Why? Because they're all doing the same thing. They're on their way from from their summer haunts and moving into their winter home. And all you have to do is is intersect that. Just intersect that one spot in between that's holding, them, and you'll have a time of your life. Time of your life. So. Um, you still have to 
you still have to find those fish on like everything Gans says everything is still perfect you either need your electronics or you need to drop a line to actually do the last the last element is to catch the fish right to find the fish again that's why your electronics come in so handy that's what we do now i mean with stuff like live scope now we we can basically take a quick scan fish of the area as scan as you're fishing uh you know what i don't like this they're not here boom you go you move on until all of a sudden oh wait a second there's something there there's some stuff going on there so you know, for, for us, we may, once again, we oversimplify it, but, but, but it is fairly easy because in, in most bodies of water that we're familiar with, we have a pretty good handle on those locations. We have a good idea of where that, you know, winter area is. We have a pretty good idea of where that summer holding area is and even where spring spawning takes place. So it's not quite as difficult to find. I know it could be a, a daunting task for somebody who is not as familiar with, uh, with, the processes we are but it's not tough it honest to god it is not tough you just, you have to apply yourself and you can't do it without looking at maps whether they're electronic or old school maps you have to have a sense of of where you've got to start and then you cannot you can't do it once you get over the the map the chart part of it you can't do it without electronics unfortunately unless somebody takes you there you yeah. can't do electronics it's very hire a fishing guide but he, but he's done it through electronics he's done it the, the hard way you know what yeah. i mean you're part of the, and, and one more quick one on maps the the more rudimentary the maps are of your lake the more important it is to make your own maps and your own fish finders your own gps i should say okay on, on ours we use garmin quick draw I, I, all the all the units how the different manufacturers do it make your own map because your the map that you draw out in your GPS is the correct map. Okay, hopefully it has one foot increments and you will get a picture that is real. Water levels might change a little bit. Okay, just use that in your head. Oh, it's three feet shallower or deeper. Some, uh, like in the garments, you can actually change that number if you want. You don't really need to, but use those maps that you make. Create your own maps and then use them and keep them forever. And, it, and it's so accurate too. So, anything else? Hopefully, that, hopefully we. There's a bunch of them went crazy on that one a little bit but uh has uh turnover started in lakes uh in water north of Sudbury great Ooh, question. Great, great question question. i think it's too early yet but uh, that might be uh i, I don't know i'm not i'm i think i'll i'll bet you the water temperatures in Sudbury are only in that mid to high 60s ranges as they are in the little bit north of here too last weekend i was a bit i was an hour and a half north of here that was 68 degrees so i bet you it's still in that because they're still getting warm weather, I, I'm going to guess. Because it's funny, I found that it's quite amazing that however different types of body of waters there are, the water temperatures stay the same, quite consistent throughout a lot of the, a, a large area. So Lake Ontario surface temp is a lot of times the same same degrees as Bay of Quinney, as as the Rice Lake, as Lake Simcoe. It's very similar. You think they're all different because they're different types of body, but that surface temperature stays the same a lot. Now, yeah. the bottom temperature is a big difference. It might be different too, and that's when the turnover happens, but I think it's still a little early. Don't you, Ange? We're, we're definitely disadvantaged a little bit this year because normally by you know early September, uh, we will have spent, oh, I don't know, already about... Uh, I'm going to say 60 days, maybe more, on a variety of different lakes from from the extreme north right down to the far farthest southern reaches in the country. So we we'll, we have a better handle on what the daily temperatures are. This year that hasn't happened. So as I always tell people, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen sitting in your garage in your boat. That's why it's important that you don't predetermine what's happening out in the field until you get out in the field and get a sense, get a lay of the land, if you will, especially when it comes to lure selection and, and a, a presentation. A lot of us do it and, and ourselves included, you know, we'll go out with a predetermined uh, uh, notion that we're going to go drop shotting today. Well, it's, 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 it's a d difficult thing to do unless you're on location on the spot and temperatures and turnovers are no different. Right. So, you have to around for sure. Uh, there was an interesting one. Uh, no, that's not the one, but we'll go ahead, Pete. Yeah. Uh, have we ever fished for blue pickerel or blue walleye? My husband and brother caught some. Very cool. Do they? Do you know if they are safe to eat? Yes, we have fished for them. I remember I fished them as a kid on a on a Lovering Lake in Sudbury area. It's funny Tim said that. 
um, caught them and, and we ate them uh, back then and, and they were delicious. They were the same. There's just a different skin pig, uh, pigmentation in the skin, I think, right? It's just a different uh, look to them. There's blue pike as well out there right now too, but there's not as many. Um, I believe they're still a, considered a walleye, right? Answer not that they're on the regular walleye so, list of uh, in your so I've heard right? a couple of different uh, theories, both of them, you know, by qualified people uh, that it's a subspecies and I've also heard it's the same species, just totally different feeding patterns. Then I heard that they were a subspecies and they are a small, they have a, a much smaller growth rate than a traditional walleye. And then that theory got all shot to hell earlier on this. In fact, a couple of months ago, and I shared this with you, Pete, I was contacted by somebody that told me about this incredible blue walleye fishery that he has encountered. And the fish are giants, giant blue walleye. When I say giant, I mean six pounds plus up to 10, which I'd never even heard of before. No, uh, yeah. So having said all that, um, I don't know. I, 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 I I don't know which theory I buy, whether it's a subspecies of walleye or whether it is no different than a normal, what we call yellow walleye, but is eating, uh, has a totally different diet. One thing that seems to be common in, in all of the stories I'm hearing is that they are, they predate in much deeper water than traditional walleye. Oh, really? So, yeah, that kind of seems to be the commonality is that everybody who's reporting of catching them generally is a little deeper than you would normally find walleye. So I don't know. They're cool, though. If you've never seen one, they're... Yeah, they're it's a neat-looking fish. It's yeah. not as pretty as a perfect golden walleye, though. You have to say that walleye of northern Ontario waters has got that beautiful gold sheen to it with a dark back and an almost yellowish in the belly. It's got some white, but it's got, that's the that's the best looking walleye to me. They're just... You're making me hungry, damn it. Oh, no <laughs> kidding. Because they, they turn a nice golden brown in the frying pan, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, but there was an interesting uh, one uh, that I wanted to deal with. Uh, had to do with trout. Oh, right? your favorite trout lure was it? Was your all-time favorite trout lure? Uh, no, it was the one below that one. Although we could we could deal with that too. But it was What's something. Blake, I, I wonder, Blake, you get, there's different trout species that would warrant different lures too. So you might, if Blake can write, write in a new comment as to which trout he's talking about, maybe we can go back to that one. If we want to generalize, I will say that you know spoons seem to be the lure du jour, if you will, for most trout. Yeah. A variety of different types, sizes, shapes, actions. But spoons seem to work. Well, you know, spoons are used more often for trout fishing. Therefore, they right. seem to catch more trout. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. And that can go from, from browns to rainbows to lakers, to, to, you know, to steelhead to whatever. They a Spoon works in all those species. So it's a very good debate. Now, for lake trout, we uh, we've done really well with flatfish too, right? And so you and I did that in Athabasca, and then and uh, in Trophy Lodge and Plumbers Lodge, you go to there, they they run the biggest flatfish they can find, and that's what all the guides run. So there's a there, you know there's a variety of, but there's some trends in the world of of trout for sure. Yeah, like fish or flat. I mean, either one. They're about the same, just different methods. Yeah, just big ones. They like to run the big ones for the giant fish. So and weird colors too, eh? A, a oh yeah, pink. Yep. Pink, that pink, we did that one day. Yeah, craziness. So then we're talking about lure color. There you go. Pink doesn't matter. Sorry about that. Let me share a funny story with you on that. So Pete and I are fishing on, on uh, in northern, north, northwestern corner of Saskatchewan. And uh, we're out in the middle of nowhere fishing for giant lake trout. And at one point, and I don't remember the, the incidents, but anyways, at one point, he had broke, I'd, I'd been catching fish on this gaudy looking pink uh, uh, lure and uh, Pete refused to put one on. He just didn't want it. But at one point, some, and I don't recall what happened. Maybe you do, Pete. But for some reason or other, because he was running the boat, he was running the motor, I had to put a new bait on for him because he had just broken off, but he needed to maneuver the boat. And and so, I, you know, I 
I said, oh, let me tie that on for you. And so I, I tied on this gaudy looking pink flatfish and I threw it out. Hey, you didn't even see what I was. I said, yeah, you're good. You're good. Put it out there. Get it out there. Within 10 minutes, boom, the biggest fish of the day. And I kept talking as he's fighting. I said, you're not going to like what you caught that on. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That, and that fish, that fish was 35 to 40 pounds. I'm telling you, it was a laker of all lakers. It was a tank. I it said, you're not going to like it. I'm yeah. telling you. I laughed so hard. Oh, my God. That that, that episode might be on uh, FishingCanada.com. I'm, I'm not sure about that one. So, yeah, Athabasca, Athabasca Lakers or something like that. And you did a pike episode up there, and I did the Laker episode up there. And, uh, yeah. So check it out. Uh, Athabasca, Lake Athabasca in northern Saskatchewan. I think we, we, we produced that about, I don't know, five years ago. Yep. Uh, yep. Great episode. Check it out for sure. Um. Trusty red and white daredevil spoon. Somebody's got in there. I see another flat fish in there. Absolutely, those are all those are all staples for for big fish and pike and for lakers and for all that kind of stuff. So you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with it. Yeah. All right, we are uh, out of here, my friends. We're gonna do the. Let's do a little of this uh, sheet of enclosing. The boys will want us to go through the website stuff because we didn't start with that. So we did talk a little bit about. There's a last week's interviews with David McLaughlin of. Uh, Lodge 88 and Buck Martinez have been made separate videos on FishingCanada.com and on the YouTube channel. Angelo, you want to take the next one? We'll just go one, 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 two, one, two. If I knew where the hell we were, I could do that. Mr. <laughs> Jeff Wilson from the East Coast provided a blog and video detailing this part of the science research project showing the process for tagging and tracking largemouth bass in the St. John River. Largemouth. Like the St. John's got tons of smallmouth. Now they got a largemouth. I already did that. I know, but I'm going over it again. So these people can go to fishingcanada.com right after. But after we're done this, they'll go to fishingcanada.com and give you a few more hits. I, I threw it out already. How about uh, Pete? Pete, that guy named Pete, he does a how-to demonstration on different methods for fixing your plastic baits. Okay, this is one that we've done forever and ever. And it's not just the gluing method. I got another one in there, uh, the both fusing methods. I'll just leave it at that. The, the, the stuff that I use is not a glue. It's a very cool mending product. And as well, you can use an open flame on a on a butane uh, torch lighter if you're very careful. Okay, and it's a pretty good video. I, I have to say, and it's not bad, eh? You know, I give a few. I loved it. I loved it. I, 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 I wish you had shared that with me years ago. I would still have uh, uh, plastics that I could use. I've been no, throwing them. Because I took them all from you, and I repaired them, and I put them on my tackle box. So I got oh. a good supply of <laughs> Uh, and at the end, there's an also there's another little tip. I won't. I want you to go watch the video. But there's another little piece of uh, some of the discarded baits. You can actually make drop shot baits out of your discarded baits, which kind of save you some money or it'll save the day sometimes too. So I saw one of those baits that you were d d chopping up, and I know how you got it damaged. I know where you got it damaged. I know where that bait works so well. <laughs> but you gotta admit, that'd be a good little drop shot bait, wouldn't it? Okay, you know what I mean. As as a, as a Good. It looks so good that I went into my bag of goodies and I got some brand new versions of those. <laughs> That's how good it was. Okay? I love it. I love it. Uh, this week's hotspot is on Rice Lake, Ontario, and uh, specifically a terrific carp spot. Now, it's odd that we would we would we would highlight a terrific carp spot on Rice Lake. Here we are, early September. Does that seem odd? Not one day. For carp in September on Rice Lake. O M G. Of course. Thank you. Of course you can. Brought that up is because most people just automatically assume that carp is early in the year when you can see them in the shallows and 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 you go and pick out a a nice little point and start fishing them. Ah 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 ah. It's the hardest time to catch them when you can see them in the shallows jumping around. Exactly. So. Uh, get on that uh, coordinate. It's on fishingcanada.com right now, and it's this week's hot spot, Rice Lake Carp Fishing. And if you haven't tried carp fishing, great opportunity right now uh, because it's all shore stuff. So even if you don't have a boat and you don't want to go after them, uh, uh, the GPS coordinate. And that leads us into the next one. Oh, sorry, buddy. That leads us into the next one. Will put a new uh, uh, carp, uh, top five carp, best urban 
carp destinations. So uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with Angela Hotspot he just talked about. And it's a great article just went up. And Will's been writing some great pieces. Uh, we looked at the Angela and I looked at this one yesterday or the day before, before we put it up. And it's it's got some great spots and some great suggestions with the spots and a little bit yeah. of the news. I had a couple of issues with it and I said, okay, it's fine. You know, but what, was your, what was your issues? Well, there was no pictures of me in it, but you know, that's all right. I, I, you know, you got a picture of you. Of course, of course, of course it's got a picture of you. How many carp have you caught in the Toronto islands? How many? Yeah. I don't know. A half a dozen. How many pictures do you have of you with carp in the Toronto islands? None. We needed a picture of somebody with carp in the Toronto Islands. Well, you know, sometimes when you're trying to put your best foot forward, you have to write a story to match the picture as opposed to. I should have put one of those large mold bass pictures you have the Toronto Islands and Will's yeah. carp articles, eh? Exactly. Hey, buddy. How many largemouth have you caught under the CN Tower, hey, my friend? Everybody. I know this is a carp thing, but there is bass there too. So let's, oh, well, let's get back to that carp fishing now. I get it. I get where we're going with this now. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's an interesting read, if you don't mind the pictures, the images. But <laughs> right. uh, we have some new posts that we're putting out. Uh, uh, catch of the day. I wasn't aware of this. Are you aware of this, Mr. Bowen? News post, not new. News. Uh, catch of the day. A 100-pound snapping turtle. That's a good one. Wow. You know uh, what? I did a little research into that inch, and they get to like 150, 175, 200 pounds, these alligator snappers, and bigger. That's, that's, that's insane. That's scary. Never mind, never mind, you know, uh, giant musky bites woman in northern Ontario. That doesn't frighten me half as much as a 150-pound snapper. Exactly. And oh. And they got that little tongue. They got a little worm on their tongue. They, they sit there with their mouth wide open. They get this little worm. And the fish goes by. Psh, snap. Do you remember, do you remember on, um, oh, God. Oh, my God. I just went brain dead. Where do we fly in for those that great bass fishing lake? Hasty? Hasty. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're That's welcome. right. That's my wingman. And they have a picture of me too. Every now and then I have a picture. If you don't have a picture of a fish, then you got me to have one and I'll just throw one in there in case, just in case. Do you remember that snapping turtle that chased us around the lake on, uh, on uh, Hasty? Oh, yeah. Stayed right with the boat. Like he stayed on us. Like it was, he wanted to attack us. Right around. He kept, we had to keep moving because he kept catching up. He was right? big, wasn't he? I won't say he was 100 pounds, but but from where we were, you know, on that boat, he was. He 50 you, know, my, you know, my theory on that one is, on that one, because I thought about that after, probably never share with you, I might have, is that on those little flying trips like that, a lot of guys have a stringer. There's no live wells in the boat, and they want to keep bass to eat. But that turtle's gotten used to a stringer hanging off a boat, and he's he's been eating off those bass, those live bass and that, because they do it at the docks and all that kind of stuff. So I'll bet you that, that turtle is used to a boat, hears the sound of the motor, and comes over and investigates and tries to get a free meal. I'll bet you. Gary, remember we had to... oh my god the, the the footage we also put a piece of footage in that uh, news piece on the website about a, a snapping turtle that came right up to our lens of our camera and then took off you wouldn't believe how fast they can swim under that water like a big this is probably a 20 or 30 pounder but you won't believe how fast they can move when that they was on, uh, martin river yep exactly exactly another news post on fishcan.com angler on the sacramento river uh, catches quite a shock when he reeled in live explosives. Yeah, pipe, live pipe bombs. Two two different guys got two different pipe bombs in the same area. Think about that. They had to get the bomb squad and the local Sacramento police bomb squad in to, dis to disable these friggin' pipe bombs in the water. If you read about it, I think the, the theory is that the, somebody was in there illegally poaching and trying to drop so imagine that, eh? <laughs> Crazy. Anyway, have we read everything you wanted us to read, buddy? Are we? Are we? Did we do a good job? You can well, well, tomorrow's, tomorrow's uh, Fishing Canada show. You're, you're, there's another page, Viola. You got to read all the pages, Viola. Okay. 
There's another guy that's to tune in tomorrow's is uh, Max Hamish Lake, where Stephen Nizwicki and I go to that one and uh, and try our, our luck at the walleye and pike that uh, Earth put us on many, many years ago. Ange and, I, Ange and Nick discovered the lake, then Ange and I went in now, and then Steve and I went in there. And we had to do a little Arctic grayling on there as well on that show. And then uh, you can do the call to action. Angelo says call to action. Angelo, please read these three points. Uh, tell viewers that they can interact with you during the live stream. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, so confidently, I, I like this one. Confidently throw to graphics. Because I, 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 I guess... I guess we didn't have any confidence in the past. No, 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 no. This one is to thank you for uh, watching and participating. Ask them to support the live stream by subscribing on YouTube, liking, uh, this, uh, and remind them with all the contest bonus code that's coming up at the end of this thing, and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, my Who is God. them? Who is it's them? It's hard to soar like an eagle when you work with a beagle. That's all I can say. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I had a big one. It was the biggest pig I've ever. It's worse than a lab, that dog. It was the worst dog ever, but anyway. All right. We got to get FNC in shape. We got to get back there and uh, bolt everything. Yeah. Together. We get out and do some of this fall fishing that everybody is raving about. Yes. Yeah, I can't wait. Everybody uh, that's watching this to uh, target from here on in. Here over the next two or three weeks, uh, really focus on your fishing. It will... It will pay off in spades. This is the time of year. And yes, yes, damn it, pull out a, a lunar uh, uh, chart. This is a perfect time of year to do go. that. Remember we did uh, we did that uh, a couple of years ago. It was October, and we, we said we want to go smallmouth bass fishing at the best possible time late in the year on the best possible smallmouth bass water that we know of. And we did that on a perfect lunar calendar, and what happened? We caught them. Big time. We caught them, and we weren't even ex we weren't even sure if we were going to catch them because it was shallow smallmouth, and we got them. We said it's too late for that. It's too cold for that. It's too this and that for the other. We got them. So there you go. <laughs> Tip of the day. All right, folks, we're going to cut out of here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, appreciate all of your comments. Hopefully we answered everybody's, and if we didn't, uh, we will uh, endeavor – once again, next week, to do a better job. That's Hey, listen, that's oh. all you can ask for. Next Watch week. Me. By the way, next week's cast is going to be a beauty. Thank you for mentioning that. It's going to be a beauty. If you oh. – I don't know if I can give it – okay, I won't give it away. I won't give the guest away yet. But if you have any form of a sense of humor out there, you watching, you people watching right now, on that whole list over there, if you have any form of a sense of humor – you are going to laugh your asses off at next week's show because our guest is the funniest man I've ever fished with in my entire life, and he is just a character of all characters. And we can't tell him this week? No. Well, well, maybe they can go back to our site and, and they'll get their notifications for sure during with the emails and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know if the boys want us to uh, uh, see. They're not the guest is a beauty. They didn't write the name in, so I'm not gonna. I'm not going to be the guy that blows it. So what's with all this secrecy crap? These are our peeps, man. I have no secrets from them. He's the funniest man in fishing. How's that? The funniest the man. Funniest. Fishing. Not fishing funny man. I know there's guys. Mikey Miller was a funny guy. Dave Mercer is a funny guy. Those guys are funny. But this guy makes both those boys look like choir boys. Okay? Before we go, the message. Remember earlier on I said there's a message, Mike, I want to deal with. And then, then like, you guys missed it. And then we just got on to something else. And we just, like usual, I... You know, but there was a message there that had to do with you mentioned Mike Miller it had to do with all of these TV guys. Oh right, I saw that. Yeah, if we're, we're going to have Bob Azumi, Mike Miller, Atala Labignan, or uh, and there was one more in there that they said to have him on the to have him on the show if we ever have them on there. Right. I just want to address it if we could, uh, if you can find it, Mike. I know it's difficult. It's the end of the day, and you've been. Oh, it's, it, it's just been too long. I know the one. Someone was asking about uh, Azumi. Um, and Miller. Uh, Miller and would uh, have them on the show. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. So here's what I'd like to do. Here's what because because I agree with you. I think that'd be wonderful. So here's what I'd like you to do if you could for us. And you've gone to bat for us before, and and so I'm going to ask you to go to bat for us again. If you would like to have those folks on this program, might I suggest dropping them a quick line and saying, hey. How come you haven't been on 
the show with the boys. And I think you should be there because I would like to sit and listen to your crap. I mean, your your spew and intelligence and stuff, and see what they see what they come back with. Would you agree with that, Pete? That Absolutely, be? I like that idea. Just, get a hold of their camps and then see if we can get the yeah get them to uh, participate. It'd be very nice. To, but and <laughs> help Sarah over here a lot because Sarah's always she's always looking for guests too, and she's working her butt off trying to get them. So you know, right. And, and, and the reason I say that, sometimes it's better if it comes from third party saying, hey, I'd really be interested in, in, in as seeing you on, on that show, on that format. And so, uh, you know, maybe you should be on it. So, and see what they, see what comes. I, I, I think we'll all be pleasantly surprised if you do it versus us. Because sometimes, as Pete said, Sarah just can't get through to their there, see, it's our people calling those people. They're people, right? And sometimes that's not the right way to do it. So they got uh, our number blocked, kid. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you, I would respond a lot quicker if if somebody from from the audience contacted me and suggested that I do something like that. I'll be very honest with you. You get my attention a lot quicker than any of those guys do. So um, there's last the last point there. It, uh, as far as our guest, I believe it is always shared at the very end of the show uh, after the teaser plays. Same every week. Stay tuned. So hopefully that's uh, they're talking about that. Hopefully. No, I think they're I think they're talking about the code. Oh, the sure. code. See, see, you have this thing. You think all these people are here for you? Not for me. For J. Uh, oh, I almost gave it away. You, you, you that? Here for yeah, you. That was, that was given. No, they're not here for me. They're here because in a second or two, Mike is going to put up this week's special bonus code where they can get the goods. The so extra. they're not here at all for me? Zero? Not no. one? Get out. Are you kidding me? Oh, Slugbug55. I love that name. Slugbug55. That sounds like a, a heavy metal rock star. Slugbug55. Get in your head. Get your head. All what? right. They hate can me. We get here? Are we Why? done? Why do they hate me? Uh, we, oh, you ruined my weekend. My long weekend. And everybody hates me. Oh, look at that. A long weekend. Okay, everybody. We got to go now. Don't get the boss going on long weekend thing because you'll be here for another hour complaining and whining and crying about everything else I got in the world. Okay. Here we go. We haven't had enough time off this year. We now need one more. Let's, let's throw it. The rest of your team is going to be and we might as okay. well, in the following week, let's throw another vacation week in there. Why the hell not? Hey, Mike, what are, is there a mute button you could put on him and just have him rant and rave in his own room and then he could he could just absorb himself like he usually does? Is there a way of doing this, Mike? All right. <laughs> okay, right. we got to go. Have a great time, everybody. Have a great long weekend. Thank you for joining us. Uh, FishingCanada.com. Don't forget to uh, enter and enter often. FishingCanada.com has the uh, giveaways that you need to be involved with. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go there and check it out. Uh, thanks, and talk to you next Friday. Take care. Bye-bye. Up here in BC, north of the Rockies. Oh, oh, oh. I guarantee you we're running along thousands of fish. I'm seeing them on live scope. We're catching them on every drop. Oh, there he is. I got him. <laughs> well, buddy, I see 20 right now in front of me. Here in northern BC. Man, oh man, this fishery is ridiculous. Powerful. Oh. I catch these fish all day long.